Good evening. Welcome to the May 10th, 2017 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Could we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, if we could start off with a roll call, please. Ms. Shoup? Yes. Mr. Blaze? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Richard? And Mr. Louise Here. And a couple of notes here. Uh, Mr. Louise is back. And as per custom, uh, when a chairman comes back, uh, they usually come back as a voting member. It doesn't have anything to do with anything other than the fact that they've got the experience and that's what it's all about. So uh, welcome back. I know it affects a couple of people, but not by anything that they did. Or issues with them, it's just strictly policy that has happened. Oh, it's standard operating procedure, and I just want to make sure people know that. Mr. Stark is no longer with us, he's still alive, but uh, <laughs> in New Hampshire, and I don't think that really counts. So, uh, he did a great job as chair also when he was chair, and uh, we can thank him for that. We do have one cancellation or postponement. We'd like to table to the next meeting first on the agenda would be. Appeal number 2601, it's a practical difficulty appeal for Timothy Dutton, 58 Ocean Avenue. Uh, and if you have any desire to sit in on that one, you can leave uh, because that will not be heard tonight. And let's see where are we at. I think uh, motion for the minutes of the uh, March, actually oh, the April 12th minute, minutes. Motion to approve it's presented. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? Mr. Wazowski, have a chance. Uh, no, I'm going to abstain. Okay. All in favor? That's uh, unanimous for one abstain. Okay. Okay, the first appeal is appeal number 2602. It's practical difficulty request by Dale Tem, 161, two rod road assessor's map, R32. Parcel 21A, this is a table from the previous meeting for more information. And we have representative, excuse me, we have a representative and we'll go from there. <laughs> to the tough word tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Dale Tem of uh, the applicant. Uh, if you recall, we were here last month. Uh, we were tabled. Uh, the board requested some additional information. Uh, so what we did obtain was specifically were uh, the plans that had been referenced within the uh, uh, the appeal that had been referenced back in 2007. I didn't find them totally enlightening, to be perfectly honest with you, but I think it did show a couple of lots that uh, uh, kind of angled back so that they didn't have the actual uh, uh, setback, if you will, the front setback. Um, at the, at, that was the road frontage associated with the individual lots. Uh, what we also obtained was the actual building permits that had been issued for those uh, three exhibits that we had passed in for those specific lots. Um, and I thought that some of them, especially part of uh, Exhibit B, uh, was very uh, telling in the fact that uh, they actually included a sketch associated with the building permit. And as part of that sketch, it actually showed the angled property line coming back uh, off in Burnham Road. Again, as part of my uh, supplemental submission, Mr. Chairman, that was shown as uh, as Exhibit B. Uh, and again, you know, uh, very familiar, very similar, if you will, to the same type of lot that we were talking about. Uh, our exact same uh, same type of situation, if you will, in terms of uh, the road frontage angled uh, quite drastically associated with the road to kind of pinch off and then go back. Uh, if you looked at the building permit, the issues that these folks were looking at were the fact that they did have the road frontage, they did have the required front and rear setbacks, they did have the actual area associated with the lot. Uh, so again, we thought that was very in keeping, if you will, uh, with our lot associated with the, the proposal we had here. Uh, as we discussed, this was a lot that was created in 2005. Um, the way that the code, as we understood at that point in time, and was interpreted, uh, was the fact that uh, you know it wasn't required, it wasn't interpreted that the frontage had to extend the full depth of the front yard setback. Uh, we had provided numerous examples of lots and subdivisions uh, that actually uh, uh, depicted that. 
Uh, obviously, those were approved lots within the subdivision. Obviously, the planning board couldn't approve those lots if uh, it was the interpretation at that time that they did not meet space and bulk requirements for the zone. <coughs> Again, the exhibits that were provided with the building permits, obviously the code enforcement officer couldn't have uh, issued those building permits uh, if it was in his interpretation at that time that those lots met space and bulk requirements. Uh, so again, from our standpoint, it was just further proof, if you will, uh, that up to uh, the decision that had been referenced in 2007, uh, that it was not an issue at that point in time, or the interpretation wasn't consistent at that point in time, the fact that the road frontage had to be or carried back all the way to the front setback. Um, so with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, it was more for supplemental information to you folks. Uh, we had gone through the uh, six items associated with the variance. We'd be happy to go through that again if, if, if necessary. Uh, but uh, aside from that, I think we would just say that, you know, you asked for some supplemental information. We, we hope we have provided that to you. And aside from that, uh, 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 Dale Tem and myself would be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you. We will go through it again. We've had, we have a new member, and so I do want to go through it again. I also want to get whatever we decide on record. Uh, but we'll try and make it, uh, we'll do it the light way. Um, why don't I open up the board for any questions uh, regarding what we were trying to accomplish as far as explanations on the changes. Um, or issues or thoughts on this is specifically about uh, the road frontage and the way the lot angled and how it has to be um, the width of the all the way back straight back so, so that you can have uh, the envelope big enough to, to put the home exactly that's the best way to describe it uh, anything before I do that anything to add if you found out anything from the search room? Now you have done some research that I think I can bring forward that will help. Just for the record, three of us here voted against the appeal that was used as an example. I find yourself, myself, and uh, Mr. Blaze. We're all here um, on that last one when we, when we turned down that other one. So it goes back to how. Back when it was seven? Yeah. It was. Yeah. It's, it's So just back to the board for questions or concerns. Uh, let me kind of summarize what I kind of feel. Uh, yeah. I, I've tried to do a lot of research on this, and there are, as pointed out, numerous properties prior to the letter that came from Mr. Van Yotis, uh, our attorney, um, that allowed for uh, changes. However, uh, after that letter, it was deemed, as far as I can tell and from what I've heard, uh, from just making some phone calls and, and trying to get to a handle of what's going on and looking through the guidelines, is there was an unwritten rule as, as to that would be the way it would be done from that point on. And it looks like a couple of other um, uh, organizations, I won't name the names, have used the same model based on what they assumed was a regulation uh, since 2005, whatever the date was on that letter. Um, that brings up an interesting point to me uh, because it isn't, as far as I can see, anywhere in the guideline. And from what I've heard and checked into, it's never been voted on, it's never been put in the guidelines. It is a practice that took place after that vote. But what, that what was the timing of that? 2005 was the letter from the attorney? Uh, 2007. 2007. Mm -hmm. letter from the and this lot was done in 2005. Correct. So there's a couple of things here that are interesting. Number one, it was allowed to be done and uh, it was before the, before the change. And everything I can read is that the change was caused by that letter. Uh, everything I've heard. And again, it's hearsay, so you can take that hearsay as you will. But it, it, what uh, you can do, count it or not count it, dismiss it or, or accept it. Uh, but in the prior to that, uh, the, the rule was good for you, congratulations, you beat the system. And after that, uh, it came to a more formal format, but it was a zoning board, planning board uh, uh, 
standard rather than anything required. So, and nobody ever pushed it, so it never got tested. Um, so that being said, I, I get that out on the table. The other thing I think that's important, and, and I am still, I'll, I'll be candid, I didn't hide it the last time and I'll still state where I stand on this. I do believe this meets the requirements for two reasons. Number one, it was standard operating procedure prior to 2007. There are numerous examples of that taking place in 2007. But most importantly, I go back to the intent of the ordinance. It's a farm, the zone is, is a rural farm, right? It's an RF, is it? RF zone, isn't it? It's, it's an overlay type of thing. Brian, can you help me with that? If I forget exactly the bit. Basically, it requires 200 feet it, of frontage. The, the, the underlying is the RF in terms of 200 feet of frontage and 80,000 square feet. And, and having my experience on the ordinance committee back in the day when I was in the council, the, the reason why you set up different standards for different areas in town is to limit the homes in a certain amount of area. You've got a 400 feet put piece of property that a house was built on the middle of, back before, more than likely back before the ordinance was in place. And now you've got a property that was broken apart in 2005. Is that correct? I want to make sure my facts are right. That's correct. Yes, 2005. And they did what was commonly known as this little triangle to get the 200 feet to meet, meet the rule. Uh, and then, uh, as I was able to find, I think I could find five or six of them <coughs> that were done like that. And then um, we've still got the net result of the ordinances intent, in my opinion, which is two properties for every 400 feet, or one property for every 200 feet. So given the fact there's no way that the Thames could have known that at the time, and it was standard operating procedure, or it appeared to be, uh, that there are other examples, and that I cannot find any evidence that anything that the town manager, that nothing other than this letter that was put forward because of a totally different issue uh, was used as the new standard by the zoning board. I don't see how we can refuse this, but that's me. I'll let the board speak from there, and I'm only one vote and one opinion, but I'm consistent with my last conversation. I'll open it up to the board. I mean, I agree with Mark. I mean, I think he's provided more evidence to basically support your argument here, and I mean, some of the lots that you've shown have even greater, what you want to call these triangle situations here, and they were able to build on them, and I honestly was thinking it was more of a triangle situation um, from last month looking at this. I mean, I think I'm totally in agreement with you, Mark. Thank you. I agree with you also, Mark. Um, in I've got another concern. I don't know how many other lots we have in this town that uh, are affected by something like this, other than the one that you own. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is, and, and coming back to uh, just kind of one way down this way here, and I'll, I'll continue my thoughts. You have I mean, I reviewed the minutes from from the previous meeting, and I I agree that based on what's been happening, um, I don't I don't have any uh, issues with this with the stands. Mr. Chair, I asked for information from you just to <coughs> I got information from you on this because I didn't have it up front because I'm coming in so late. I thought you would shorted me information, which is why I was sitting here not saying anything. <laughs> Again with a short joke. Again. <laughs> it's not a short joke. Uh, <laughs> I just left names out of anybody I talked to. But, but what, I, what I did do was I read through the notes from 07. Because when you were when we were talking about this on the phone, you had said that there were appeal notes uh, from 07. So I looked those up, and there was one area that kind of caught my eye. It was probably about, and that was uh, appeal 2372 uh, back in 07. And about four paragraphs in. Which one is that reference? Is that the one with this private road? Yeah, it's the same one. Yeah, same okay, one. same one. Okay. Yeah. Just for people who don't know, uh, the, what seems to be the trigger that made these changes is a somebody had two lots on uh Gorm Road, wasn't it? I think it's Gorm Road. Drive, drive, I think it was and uh they wanted to put a driveway in and build two more lots behind it, but they didn't meet the minimum front 
setbacks, uh, side, front, uh, street, uh, furnace. street furnace, thank Correct. you. And we denied it. And the, uh, our town attorney supported that position because there wasn't enough street furniture. But somehow back in 2007, it was interpreted as, by somebody that that meant you had to have these new standards. And it, 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 it is what's been done, but it's not part of, it's not part of ordinance. It's just what's been done. One of the points that the Arab lawyer at the time had made, he said, he stated that the purpose of the front yard requirement was not necessarily located uh, to locate houses exactly on the street and lots could not be on hammerheads or cul-de-sacs if, the, if that were the purpose, meaning that they couldn't become rectangular. I live on a cul-de-sac, so it kind of stuck in my mind. So I went to Google Maps and I laid out my neighborhood just to see if I would come in compliance with the way it sits today. And the answer is no. All the houses in the circle of the cul-de-sac don't have proper frontage, but they're still constructed back off the front of that street the right distance. So then I looked out, I, I live in the, the neighborhood, in the uh, Pleasant Hill neighborhood. So then I backed out, looked at some other neighborhoods, because I remember some lots that had houses that sat back from the front. It just didn't seem normal. So I went to an aerial view and looked at that. And there were a couple of instances, and there's probably more like seven or eight instances in my neighborhood alone, where there's a back lot that they tried to get access to. And the one I'm talking about in particular is Powder Horn, where the frontage that that lot has is much less than the requirement. And there's a straight piece that goes back about 78 feet, and then there's a big chunk behind the existing homes that are there. And that house is sitting behind. So I think, and that was back in the 80s, mid 80s to late 80s, that those were constructed. So that to me also proves your point that there's a lot of developers that probably have this circumstance that we might not do today. But back then, they were doing the best they could since the development was happening so fast. It was a real bubble back then. So to keep up, people were throwing up tons of lots. And I think it just got biased. Now, we probably wouldn't get biased now that we're more educated or, or uh, you know, we paid more attention, but I think it just got biased. And to be candid with you, I do believe this needs to go to the ordinance committee to be discussed. At, at what, because we still don't have an answer. Uh, I believe <coughs> it needs to go to the ordinance committee because our position here does not set the precedent now saying anybody can do that, as the previous one didn't either. It just happened to, it happened to fall that way. Right. So uh, I, I'll be requesting that this vote it with the committee to be looked at. I think I'll, that's, I'll, that's I'll, what I'll work with uh, as long as that's if he agrees with me and we'll work as to getting I don't care what the answer is. I just think we need to know an answer. I think we're exposed because there could be other, a lot of other properties that try to do the same thing. Yeah. So uh, I guess to summarize, I'm in agreement with you with my little research that I did do kind of proves the points from that same direction. I don't have anything more to add than what's already been discussed. Okay. So uh, I do want to make a couple of points. The the way the property is cut, if this is approved, do I have a picture of that? I have a of that. This one right up on the screen. Oh, thank you. In this area where my cursor is. Yeah. That's the little sliver that gets to the 200. Okay. Yeah, but. But then it also narrows it down so that the, 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 the setback would have to be at least past the first bump, right? We all in agreement of that? Because you've got you to measure it from... Well, the setback is, is the 50 feet. Yeah. Okay. And then the 15 and 15 foot setbacks are mapped out on this, on this drawing. So, so in effect, from, from here to here is roughly 140 plus feet. Um, so it's a good rectangular geometry for the lot. It's just not carrying 200 feet of frontage back to that 50 foot setback, back to this line right here. Okay. Now, okay, we're okay. Because what I was worried about is where that jag comes across, whether we have to have them go back another half foot or foot or whatever that is. No, because it, their, their, their setback is yeah, their setback is, is laid out 50 feet, the required distance 50 feet back from the front property line between those those two panels. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything you wish to add? Did no, not at all, Mr. Chair. Okay. I'd like to open the public to this. Anybody from the public like to speak on this issue? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Give me a fair and state your name and address and we'll go from there. 
My name is Erica Frank, and I'm an attorney from Windham, Maine. I'm here on behalf of the uh, applicants of Butter, William Jordan. Um, we have objection to, the pro to this proposal on a couple of different grounds. Number one is that we don't have any evidence that that little sliver of a jag was ever part of any plan until now. The deeds to my client's property do not include that sliver being cut out of their property. Their property line runs all the way to Two Rod Road, straight down. Ma'am, can I stop you for one second? That's a different issue than what we're dealing with. Well, it, if it's not... It's a frontage it's, issue. Well, no. It's a deed issue. It's a title issue. It's a title issue. If there's a title problem, that's a totally different... Cause it, and it may be legitimate. I just don't know. What we understand is that. So I'm not challenging you or trying to... But, but if there's a title issue, I, that's something that needs to we be done. We don't believe that we have a title issue. I, we believe that the applicant does not have title to that property, therefore cannot be approved to build or to use that property as part of her application. Uh, they may not. And if that's the case, they'd have to come back with a separate appeal. Okay. The other, and, and that's why I'm putting this on the record, so that, that can happen. Thank you. Um, the other objection or, or thing I should point out is that the ordinance itself um, has a definition in Section 6 under definitions, lot lines. The lines bounding a lot, whenever a lot abuts a street, the sideline of the street on the side abutting the lot shall constitute the lot line. So the front of my client's lot is the street based on the definition in the ordinance it can't have a sliver cut out before it meets the street, according to the definition in Section 6. Um, so that creates, again, another problem where they can't meet, meet the footage requirements. Again, I'm not going to challenge you on that. I'm only challenging. I just know what we have for information. So that would be a, that would be a separate case between the applicant and yourself. Well, I think that the town has the obligation to make sure that the definition of lot line is met before an application can be approved. Well, we're making our decisions, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're making our decisions based on what we know for information. We're not attorneys. I'm providing you the information. But you're, you're providing it for the, app, for the, uh, the next door neighbor. Correct. And that might be good and might not be good. It's also new, and the other people haven't heard anything about it, so it's kind of taken a, as you know, you can't do that in law. So if we're taking the We just received notice of the meeting when everyone else did, so I prepared to... No, what I mean is you would have to have to disclose that to the other side prior to it. So this is not a court. I understand. So we're not going to go down that path. What we can do is we can talk about it as it sits and put a codicil in there that says if the lot is not 200 feet, we're, we're claiming, and the applicant's claiming, and the information we have says it's a 200 foot lot by that drawing and by the information we have. If there's a cloud in the title, that's a totally different conversation, and they don't have 200 feet, they'll have to make the decisions from there. Isn't one of the criteria that you have to have, they have clear title? Excuse me, I mean... Um, uh, they have to have uh, right Okay, title. so I mean, if they're coming in here and challenging the title for the property, I mean, that's a pretty big challenge. Um, and I noticed that their deed does not have a description for their property, a breakdown. Is there a that is correct. Did there, you there find one? I mean, there is a description somewhere, which would easily be found in the register. There, there doesn't seem to have been a deed cut out and conveyed to anyone. That law apparently has been created on paper, but has never been separated in title from the larger portion of land, which my client's property has been deeded out in a, in a deed from that larger portion. Um, and, and as you're, you're correct, the only deed description that stands of their property is the remaining land that hasn't been divided yet. I think it's troublesome that there's no property description for a property that's split. And Board, um, we're not here to judge, we're not, our, our purview is not to make decisions on deeds or anything else. And the process in and of itself violates a regular court because the appellants didn't even know that this was going to be coming out. So we can't even hear that issue. The question I have for you is 
do we want to table this to let this get resolved or do we want to approve it subject to that being finalized in court? And I'll give you an example of where I think this is a parallel. If you have a development and it says you can't have certain types of businesses in there, we don't look at whether or not that business meets the guidelines of that development. We look as to whether it meets the regulations of the ordinance and it's up to the people in the development to deal with it as a, as a deem fit. We've had numerous cases. <coughs> I do not know whether or not, and I'm leaning towards you, I don't know whether or not this is similar to that, um, but to me, from the information we've got, this is a surprise for all of us. I never like surprises. Um, so we're getting this here at the table. Wrong time to get it. Um, we haven't had a chance to do anything. We haven't had a chance to talk to our attorneys. Uh, to me, I don't. I think it's inappropriate that you came up with this without, without future, to be candid with you. It needed to come to the board ahead of time, and there's plenty of time to do that. I'm not, that's a, a statement. Um, I don't know what the board feels as to how they'd like to proceed. This is kind of a blow. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, maybe, the, maybe the first thing we do is give the um, appellant a chance to address that issue since it was a, a mother parcel to begin with and these lines were all created by the appellant. Am I correct? Yes. It, so so is, there, is there a description of these individual parcels that shows that this abutter, uh, their property lines are as shown on the, on the plan? Uh, Mr. Chairman and the board, I can only say that, uh, you know, the description for the abutter's lot had been based, the description that we prepared for the abutter's lot had been based upon this plan. Um, I have to admit, I don't have that deed in my hand in terms of describing that actual, the actual description associated with that, uh, but it was our understanding that, you know, that the deed had been prepared based upon that plan. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, was were your prints developed from a survey or was it developed from subsequent plot plans that you had? It was developed by a survey. The surveyor actually prepared the plan and prepared the written description for the deed. And Mr. Chairman, to the second point about the definition of lot lines, all the definition of lot lines says is that wherever a lot abuts a street, the sideline of the street, which is, if I can get my cursor on it, this is the sideline of the street, okay, all the way from, from here to here and beyond. The sideline of the street on the side of Budding, the lot shall constitute the lot line. That's all that's saying is that is that right <coughs> line where this property abuts the street is the front property line of that property. That, I'm sorry, that proves nothing. It's just a, that's the definition saying that this is the front property. <coughs> it means it has no relationship to anything we're talking about. So, Mr. Chairman, question around the survey. Did we only judge, quasi judicially judge, based on the information that we have? And the infor information we have is based on a survey that was done by a professional engineer. So, we can question the ability of that professional engineer, or we can move forward assuming that that information is correct. Now, I don't, I'm not in a position to question where that information came from, and the neighbors have every right to question where that comes from and whether it's valid, but that falls outside of our jurisdiction. We're here to judge based on the information that we're given. If we see something that's obvious that doesn't make sense and we question that data as being false, then we have the ability to send them back and get more. But I see nothing here that would say we need to go back and get more information because that was done on a professional survey and I trust that they went to a reputable surveyor and now that liability falls on that professional engineer. An issue? I mean, they need to present evidence, and I think what concerns me is the just the deed has no description. I mean, I think that's just what kind of stopped me for a minute. If they kind of kind of opened your eyes to the fact that yes, we have all the you know the plan and the plot and everything, but I think just someone who's used to papers and deeds and things like that to not see something in writing saying this is ours. Um, I think it's just again, it's a surprise in your development, and I agree with the chairman that it's, we do not like surprises. What's the will of the board? I, I, 
my personal opinion and uh, is that we make a vote based on what we have for information and had for information provided to us prior to this meeting with a codicil that says in the event that the two parties find that the answer on the, part of the street is different than what it is, then our approval would not be valid. And they'd have to come back to deal with that at that time. That would be my preference, but I'm not sure where the board sits or... Uh, if I could add... I'm a little bit concerned about uh, the fact that if it's not recognized that this little strip of land um, is valid, then that whole lot is invalid. Right, but that's as 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 um, said, pointed out, that's not going. That information is not going to be the piece that gives us the information that we need. We've just gotten kind of slammed with some well, surprise information. I understand that. But my point is that why would the town ever accept a lot being split? Oh, I see what you mean. Without the correct front yard footage. Regardless of whether it's in a regardless of whether it's in a, a deed or not. I think Brian said the last meeting people don't need time approval to split a lot like that, right? Yeah, you can you can sell any kind of property that you want. It's when you come for a building permit that we have to prove it's a buildable lot. That's why we're here tonight. Miss Mrs. Tam would like to build on this lot. I couldn't issue her a building permit because it did not meet the yard front definition in our ordinance. That's why we're here. But you can sell any parcel in any configuration. It's getting a building permit that becomes the becomes the problem. Okay, Mr. Frank, approach the uh, question. The survey that was done was it a stamp drawing? It was by a PD. A a licensed survey. A licensed Correct. Survey. Yes. Okay. Again, in my opinion, the board can't shouldn't be questioning the certified document that was presented to us. I mean, I can question any data that's out there that's not backed up by someone who's professional as being hearsay or their opinion. But if we've got a document that was presented by an engineering firm, by a certified surveyor, they could possibly have made an error, that's possible. But I'm trusting that data. I don't think that should stop us from moving forward. Even though it's not written up in the verbiage, they base that on something, and they do that every day. So I'm relying on them to do it correctly. That doesn't take away the ability of anybody who's a neighbor to question that data. But the information coming to us, I don't have, a, in my opinion, I don't have the right to question that. It Steven? seems like certified information and it's valid information. Thanks. Nice. We have a very, very powerful group of people here that know a lot. Mr. Uh, Evers? Well, so, and I tend to agree with Mr. Loisel on this. I mean, it's... As you said, we're, we're basing our information on stamp documents that have been presented for us. Uh, we can only, from my opinion, we can only really vote on what we have right here in front of us that was submitted. Um, if there's an issue of whether or not the survey was done correctly or incorrectly, that falls back to the surveyor who did the survey when it was, when it was, when it was completed. And any argument or contention or conflict against it should be settled in that venue and not here. But falls back towards you know it, maybe it requires another survey to have that to have that done you know by both parties an agreement of what whatever happens there is uh, as far as having another survey done determining exactly where these where these lines are. And I have a question about who who actually prepared the deed for lot A. You know perhaps they got it wrong. Mr. you take my phone No, no worries. <coughs> The same description has carried out through three or four deeds. I'm assuming it came from a survey somewhere, but I don't have access to that survey. Um, but the deed, um, you mentioned having, you have a certified survey in front of you here. We also have recorded deeds in front of us here that 
are very clear that there's a problem with the survey. So I don't know how the town can ignore that issue. I mean, for example, if I came in with an application and I just had a surveyor come over and I told him, here's my line, draw me a map, and I come in and apply, that there must be some verification that I actually own what they drew on the map. Mr. Chair, may I speak? Yes. What deed are you speaking to? I'm speaking to the deed that um, Ms. Tem first originally carved out my client's lot. Okay, but the, the deed that you're saying has definition is not this applicant's deed. It is not her deed. It is then we haven't seen that, so you're telling me She doesn't have one, though. But, Miss, please, you're telling me information that I'm not privy to. And I'm supposed to trust your word over that document I see that's certified. I have documents here that I can show it's you. It's not evidence in this case. It's also not appropriate at the last minute. Well, this is a public meeting, and I understand. You're absolutely you welcome. You're absolutely welcome to discuss and share happy. whatever you like, and I'm not going to shut you down. But as far as we're concerned, the information that we're supposed to be looking at, we need a reasonable. We we should not be surprised like this, and an attorney should know that. We should not be at this moment, neither should the applicant at this moment get surprised with this because it, it would be thrown out of court in a heartbeat. I believe you know. that my clients were here at the last meeting and were aware that my clients objected to the, to the project, which is why they then retained me and I am now here on their behalf. They have objected, that's very true, but nothing about the, the, the deed issue has come up. You guys unfortunately didn't make any submissions. You keep referencing something that we don't have in front of us. All we have is the information they've presented to us and that we've reviewed and looked at. And feel free to, I'd like you, anything, anything else you'd like to say, feel free, and, and I'd like the board to just give uh, Ms. Frank the courtesy of listening. I, I mean, I think I've said what I need to say, and I, I, I agree with your point that it, it, it's a very troublesome, I think, for any town to approve a project when there's a clear challenge with legal signs, deeds here available for review that would put that sliver of land into question. And in addition to that, I, I understand Mr. Frank addressed some previous lots that had similar configurations, but I haven't seen any that have such an odd configuration that is, it, it doesn't make planning sense to me to have a lot that, it, I mean, it just doesn't look right for, for one thing, but it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, it doesn't seem to be consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. And if this, pro if this uh, permit is granted, it's going to have detrimental effects on my client's property values and the use of their land. Uh, when they purchased the property, there was no anticipation that that was a lo buildable lot next door to them because of the configuration that they were made aware of when they purchased the land. I don't know anything about that, to be honest. So any, uh, for my, my thought, I mean, any conflict and, and eventual resolution regarding this regarding these property deeds and, and, and the conflict with the property lines should be resolved outside of this venue. I mean, we're not in a position to, um, as, as was mentioned, you know, to, to draw judgment on this, especially when we don't have the information in our packets that submitted to us. Um, that's, you know, when, when we receive information, it's given to us in the packet, and if, if information isn't submitted, we can't really see uh, or make a clear uh, decision without it having have it be resolved. All we can trust is the stamped documents by licensed professionals that have been submitted to us. Um, so again, reiterate my opinion that you know this falls outside of our, our, of our purview in this and that it falls back on the surveyor to and you folks to establish exactly where those property lines are and any any contentions or any resolutions should be done at that point outside of this venue. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I get the impression from the board, Mr. but I really want to fall back on your experience on this. Do you agree with the continuing forward at this point, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, in my experience in the board, I mean, I don't have a problem with your recommendation of passing it. I mean, I think, again, making our decision on the evidence that was presented to us today, I feel like we can go through the criteria. Thank you, Vice. Other members? If there were legal action. They can stop the process once they file whatever paperwork goes with the court, correct? Okay. So even if we make judgment, if they file papers, that stops the ability for the appellant to move forward, correct? That's correct. 
I mean, I think it's important to clarify that they're, they're talking about a title dispute, but I don't want the town to incur an appeal of our decision because they're going to appeal our decision instead of passing out the title. I think we're protected in that way, and that we didn't judge based on information that we didn't have in front of us. And the judge would look at it and say, what did you have in front of you when we had that information? But are we going to vote on something that we know they're going to appeal? I mean, I'm trying to... Anybody could do that. And the example of that, the best example I've seen is when we've approved things that are not allowed in a neighborhood's, whatever they call it, the condo docks, whatever it happens to be, and it falls where it falls. If the neighbors want to sue, they can sue. If they don't, they don't have to. But we've given them permission from a town point of view. We don't care. Oh, you're talking about deed restrictions or conditions. Right. Yeah. Is that a fair statement? Can I have the appellant approach the podium again, please? No problem. Public is also, it's still open as a public session. My question for you is if you felt there was going to be pressure or potentially a lawsuit filed, would you be willing to work with the neighbors to try and define whether this layout actually meets the deed or not? Is that something you'd be interested in or something you would not want to do? Oh, I think it's something we'll certainly be very interested in, yes. Again, obviously, you know, from a title standpoint, we were certainly, as I stated, the surveyor who had done the survey actually prepared, you know, what we call it a suggested deed description, a written that he provides a meets and bounds description, if you will, which is given to the attorney. The attorney obviously takes that description and then obviously, as you know, can add language to it and those types of things to actually prepare the deed. If we were to table this for another month, would it hurt the applicant's ability to do what she needs to do in the timing that she needs to do in it? No. I'm just making a suggestion. If we were to table this, would you open yourselves up to meet with the neighbors to iron out the details around this so that we know whether it did or did not match? Is that something that would be workable for you folks? I think we have an option on the table if we wanted to table. My only concern about tabling is we're tabling on something that, number one, came at the last minute. I do not want to reward that behavior. And we're tabling on something that really doesn't concern this board. We can, and you know me, I love tabling things, but I don't see any reason to table this. I do think it needs a codicil that says in the event that, to protect the town, in the event that the two parties do not reach agreement, then this, well, it isn't resolved by a court. If two parties, for instance, party B could never bring it to court, and party A would be stuck with whatever we decided in the tabling, and that's not going to accomplish a thing. If there's legal grounds, let that work its way through the court system, and we put the defense in here for the town saying if it doesn't meet our definition, then this is null and void and she'd have to return. I would agree with the chair as far as proceeding forward with what we have presented to us with that codicil, because we're covering all the bases if we're doing that. And I think it's a prudent course of action in this case because that way, if it is proven that the appellant does have the ability to go forward and do this, they don't have to come back here. They can just move forward with it. However, if it's contingent upon the resolution of that conflict, then they can take it to whatever next steps they have to take it. Whereas in this case, if we approve it with the contingency that you're proposing, if it turns out that the appellant is okay to go forward with their project, they can do so without any more hindrances coming back before us. That's kind of what I was asking the question. It would be their option to exercise that right if they wanted to, but they could also move forward if they wanted to as well. Yes. And I think we're covering that in the contingent too. Mark, can I ask the appellant a question? Absolutely. Could you take the microphone, please? Or your representative either. And again, we're still open. Public hearing is still open. She's the only one. We promised Mr. Blaze won't bite. What is your plan for this lot? Is this lot for sale? 
the plot is for sale. When I own 14 acres, and I ask the surveyor to divide off frontage with the house that I grew up in, that they own now, with acreage, and then my husband likes to pound nails, and at some point we thought maybe he'd like to build a little something and sell it, or we'd retire there. Well, things have changed, but... Um, so they divided off this lot, and then I sold the remaining lot to someone else. So I have been approached three times by someone who's wanted to buy the lot. The Did you have a sales time, contract work? On the third time. The other two, I did. I changed my mind. I didn't want to sell it. We were going to keep it in case he wanted to build something, my husband. So you, you currently now have a sales contract on this lot? Not anymore because of the process has gone too long. They had to move on. And you're not planning on building on it now yourself? Well, I can't build because there's a problem apparently. Well. But yes, I may move over there myself because, like I said, things have changed. That, like that uh, division you spoke of earlier, of the lot, that was 2005 that I heard, correct? Correct. It was all divided, the 14 acres was all divided at one time into three parcels. Okay. Right, I'd like to go through the, uh, well, anybody else from the public wish to speak? Actually, <coughs> Feel free. If I if I could before he speaks, yes. Sean, was this plan was this plan recorded? It's just a survey plan, but it's not recorded. Uh, Larry Chase, for the record, I am the father of the homeowners, and I'm a builder in Mass. And uh, back in Mass, we have very tight guidelines to go by. And the problem that I have with this whole thing, and I've only got into it just recently. Um, the part that would bother me as a board that there is no deed on their side that states that that sliver is there. And I understand that a surveyor is responsible for his work, but if there's no deed to back that, I would be a little concerned on his behalf that I would even present this without having a deed. Whereas my daughter's property is deeded very clearly by the, you know, the state of Maine, and it is descriptive that that sliver is not in it. So, I being, if I was on the board, I would be like, without a deed on their side, I, I'd be a little bit suspicious of this sliver, um, and I'd be a little concerned about this, uh, because I wouldn't want to get in any, any trouble. I would table this until both parties had a deed. If both deeds match up perfectly, I would say, we got a problem, that sliver's not on the deed, and then this guy doesn't get in trouble. Um, it doesn't matter to us, because we will you know, go against this because our deed does not show that sliver. And we have a deed in title insurance and all that good stuff that says this is a clear title with no sliver on it. So that's a little concerning to me, a little bit concerning, that you guys would even consider looking at that and to shoot down the woman that we brought in and paid that does this for a living, that has our deed, and we just obtained her, you know, two days ago. We were asked to come back to this meeting. It was tabled. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little upset that uh, the chair of the board would even say, you know, this is last minute to bring it in. We were just asked to come here for this meeting. So I have, I have a little bit of trouble with that. I, I just don't think it's right. I mean, we have a deed, and I know it didn't get presented in the want, I don't want to confuse you at all, but just, yep. you know, they were here at the previous meeting when yep. we tabled it. Yep. And so they've had 30 days to come and be prepared, and we actually suggested they get a lawyer. My daughter's filing law was here and not myself. Okay. They did obtain a lawyer, and she's at our meeting now. And the she has problem is standard operating procedures, yep. and I don't want to get into the debate. I understand. Standard, standard you operating have procedures, yep. you do not throw something at a board at the last minute and expect us to use it. It's not, not, it's not a reasonable expectation. I would be a little suspicious that they don't have a deed and they have it on a plan. That's all I'm saying. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else wish to speak to this issue? It's also not uncommon for them to be incorrect. So what I'd like to do is anybody else wish to speak on this issue? Seeing that I'm closing the public hearing section of this meeting, I'd like to go back to the items on the practical difficulty variants. I'd like to take them case by case and vote on them separately. And Mr. Frank. John, take 
to make one again. I want to go through the I want to go through the the, the items again. That first one, I guess, is the most appropriate. Yes, I have it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Now, the need of the, for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. And as we stated, was the request for the variance was specific to the property uh, as that the, the existing house that had been located there in 2005 as related to the straight frontage required the angled property line, which led to the decrease in the width of the front yard and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Board members, have any questions of Mr. Frank on that item? All right. I uh, move that we approve section one, number one of this section. All in favor? Do oh, I have a second? I'm sorry. Do I have a second on that? Second. All in favor? That's okay. unanimous. Uh, if you'd like, feel free. Yeah. I think it'd be valuable. Nope. Great. Okay. Go ahead. Anybody else want to go first? Got it. Uh, <coughs> the reason I agree that uh, this is not a concern is the applicant showed, I don't know, five or six different cases where there were lots that did not have the full width at the road frontage. I personally looked up one myself and found that my cul-de-sac, six of the properties did not meet it. So um, that's not evidence, but I think the applicant came in and showed what they needed to show to prove that case. Other members wish to comment? And to me it's obviously the unique circumstances of the property which is that triangle. Um, and so I have no problem with that. That being, that is enough of a reason for that. So I, let me just do a motion again on that. Uh, move that number one is approved. And you second the next. All in favor? Again, that's unanimous. Number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting property. This is an important one. Uh, from our standpoint, Mr. Kim, we're talking about a single family house lot. Um, again, it's basically uh, divided 200 feet of frontage between what was a 400 foot of frontage on, a, on the roadway. The lot itself will actually have the 80,000 square feet. We'll meet all the setbacks in terms of front, side, and rear setbacks. Uh, and we certainly didn't see a single family house being constructed on that lot as having a, an undesirable effect on the neighborhood. Board members have any questions for Mr. Frank? Um, any members have comments regarding this section? I think it's important that we discuss this because it does affect the next door neighbor. My big concern in this area would be around if the density of the housing in this area went up drastically. If there weren't other properties that had houses that are relatively close, if they were just single homes, we're talking large distance away from each other, I think it would be more of a concern. If I, when I looked at the aerial map, there are other buildings in this area, so it doesn't appear to change the density, which I don't think changes the character. Yeah, I mean, the reality is I would love to live next to a brand new construction because it only really improves the value of your property. I mean, I don't, I don't really have anything to add to that. I agree with both of those points. You know, you're, you're in a neighborhood surrounded by single family lots, and according to the plan, it's some more setup that's been shown there already. Anybody else? Uh, my, my view on this is that uh, I go back to the intent of the ordinance. Uh, the RF uh, wanted to have 200 foot spaces uh, between homes, not necessarily between homes, but lot sizes to limit the amount of homes that could be there. If you've got a 400 foot space with two houses, there's no difference between a 400 foot space with two houses put side by side on the, it still has 15, 15 foot setbacks. So you could have two 200 foot pieces of property and both of them put them 30 feet apart. So that doesn't really play into the play. To me, you're getting the exact same, same result. So in my opinion, it will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. 
as it is consistent with the expectations of the underlying zone. Uh, do I have a motion? I move. Sir. Discussion of the motion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Number three. The practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Again, this is a tricky one because that, the applicant is the one that drew up the deed. That's a tough part with us. I think we spent a long time talking about how the actions were not hers. It was the board's decision in 2007. I agree. The information that was presented around the neighbor's deed is data, but in my opinion, it's not based on fact because we don't have copies of it in front of us. So if there were, this were to go to court, I couldn't judge based on that. So can't make a decision on information I don't have. But with the information we do have, unless the applicant decides to table, which is their choice, and they decide to move forward, then it opens them up for a court case, that's their decision. So based on that, the information that I have, I don't think this is, an, is, this is something done by this uh, particular applicant. It was the ruling that was done in 2007 after the lots were split in 2005. And my position tied to this is very similar. Thank you, Mrs. Shoup. It's very tied to what um, Mrs. Shoup said and, and bo both of you actually. To me, the issue is uh, there was no uh, there was no rule against this at the time. It was actually standard practice, as we can very easily establish. And the rule that went in 2007 is not a rule. It's a guideline, as far as I can see, because there's nothing written in law. It's actually just an interpretation. Interpretation. It's a change in an interpretation. Thank you. That's the best. Nothing way changed in the ordinance. It was the interpretation that changed. And the interpretation is fine. I support the interpretation. As a matter of fact, I think it probably should be that way. But it and it's held up for ten years. And numerous CEOs have taken that position. So it's not new. But it's still after the properties were split. And that is the demarcation mark. Much like nineteen ninety two would have been the demarcation mark for uh, if you almost built prior to 1992, you don't have to follow the same rules. I see this as no different than that. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, do we have a motion on that? So moved. Second. Any discussion on the motion? In favor? The item is met. Uh, there's no other feasible alternative. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. There's no other, the, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Uh, exactly, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, with the 80,000 square feet, uh, there is no other uh, feasible alternative to this lot be, being a buildable lot without the variance, as we've discussed. Any discussion? Any questions or any discussions? I agree. That's pretty clear. Yeah. Without a change, without us agreeing to it, it can't be done. Yeah, it's clear. Uh, I could see one exception to that, and that would be if um, the the standards of the town were challenged, and it was a challenge to the CEO's position. That would be a different conversation. That would be the only other way. We'd still end up in the same place with the same questions. So I see no difference whether that's the case or not. And the CEO did exactly what he should have done, which is use the standards that we've been using for the last ten years or so. So I um, offered that uh, alternative to, to the appellant to to uh, appeal for a, an administrative appeal um, to challenge my interpretation of the ordinance. They preferred to go for the practical difficulty there. Good. Thank you. So uh, any discussion on that? Questions? Comments? Motion? So moved. Second? Second. No. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? That's unanimous. The granting of the grant will result in bringing the, app the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. And as you may recall, as part of our initial submission, we included the tax map, which uh, showed the two nearest properties to the north of this actually had uh, single family homes, which this will be uh, the width of those lots were approximately 165 feet and 150 feet, which is very in keeping with this proposed lot, or this lot. Uh, so that we saw this is. Uh, uh, bringing the, the uh, property more nearly in conformance with the surrounding property. Okay. Questions? Um, I come back to the fact that it's 
400 feet with two houses. The ordinance allows for 400 feet, two houses. The rule says 200 per house. But the net result, the intent of the ordinance, is to keep houses limited. And it doesn't do any effect whatsoever to this neighborhood other than what the ordinance was originally designed to do. I think based on the information, the, the appellants provided evidence to support this. So. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the granting of variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Uh, I certainly didn't see the, uh, any adverse impact on the natural environment due to the construction of one dwelling unit in accordance with local building codes. Any questions for the other one? You're going to have to do soils tests, all that stuff. Absolutely. It's passing soils. Requirements. Nothing changes there. It's, it's not the same density. So. Okay. Uh, any questions? Do uh, I have a motion? All in favor? That's your name. Uh, the property is not located in Shore. It's not in the flood zone or anything. Well, like the shoreline is correct, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the last two, the dimensional standards, uh, those provisions, uh, excuse me, provisions of this ordinance which relate to the lot area, lot coverage, frontage, and setback, including buffer requirements. It meets side setbacks, it meets rear setback, it meets front setback. Correct. The way we're defining this. And uh, the buffer issue, um, I don't clarify the buffer anymore. I'm not familiar with the buffer issue. Um, is, that, is that when two zones bump into each other? A buffer is, yeah, it could be when two zones, a different a residential zone and a business zone or commercial zone are abutting one another. It could be a wetland buffer. It could be, uh, in some cases, the wetland buffer uh, is 25 feet, and then there's a 15-foot buffer to the wetland buffer. So, you know, it's <coughs> mean anything. Okay. Uh, that's not really a voted item. The next one is uh, the case where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property which the variance is sought would both preclude a use of property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Yeah, as we've discussed, Mr. Chairman, obviously without the variance and the fact that then we don't have a buildable lot. Basically, we have a, a 80,000 square foot unbuildable lot. So, uh, you know, uh, it's quite a difference, obviously, in terms of the economic impact associated with that. Comments from board and then. To me, this is probably the easiest one. Ms. Tim, it was your family that broke the lot out, correct? Correct. So, just for the record, you couldn't hear it. She said, Ms. Tim, it was, uh, it was their family that did that. I have a real hard time believing that they would intentionally eliminate a lot to be built on at the time. So, um, making the lot useless in value, and, and the applicant did volunteer to pay the uh, non usable price for the property at the last meeting, but I specifically asked whether they pay the usable value, and the answer was specifically no. So, in my opinion, that uh, is easily set. Uh, do I have any comments from other board members? And the, also the previous attempts to try and put the lot for sale showed intent that there was a lot there to sell. And the applicant did tell us that it's pretty much their intent right along with their husband wanting to build something there. They wouldn't preclude themselves from doing that intentionally. Anybody have that in? Okay, do I have a motion on number A, uh, I'm sorry, B1 and 2. I'm going to combine those. Make a motion. B1 and 2, do I have a second? Second. All in favor of B1 and 2 of EB6. Uh, the words with the definitions and the meanings. Uh, I believe that those have been met. In favor? Um, is that a yes? I just want to make sure you're a yes. Are you yes or no? Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. That's uh, unanimous on that. Okay, so uh, help me out with this, but I'll bring a motion forward on this one. Uh, I move to approve uh, appeal number 
2602 as requested with the codicil that in the event there is a court ruling against the appellant that establishes that they do not have that 200 feet frontage, this approval would in fact become null and void. They would have to resubmit if they felt like they chose to with the new information that the board currently does not have. Any add to that? Discussion on the motion? Anything you'd like to see added? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Sorry we didn't get you the answer you wanted, but there are options. Practical difficulty request by the Rock Church 66 Gorham Road, Assessor's Map R58, Parcel 19. We have a representative. If you could state your name and position and address, that would be great. My name is Tom Greer from Pinkham & Greer. I'm the civil engineer on the project and we have an office in Portland. With me tonight is Pastor Eric Samuelson and a church member, Chris Wilson, in order to provide moral support as much as anything else. Uh, what I would like to do is sort of walk you through the exhibits, make sure you know what we have for exhibits. We have a fair number of them uh, that, that, that you have in your package and uh, make sure that you fully understand the, the process that we went through to get here. Um, this um, practical variance is extremely important to the church. Uh, without it, uh, it puts it in a, a extremely difficult position in order to meet the needs of the church and uh, hopefully when we are done presenting our case you feel the same way. Um, we are um, glad to see that there is a practical variance within the ordinance. Uh, we think that that's a community benefit and that the board has the opportunity to approve things that might not meet the ordinance exactly but yet provide a community benefit and we think that we, we meet those standards and we think that this is a perfect project where uh, the practical variance would come into play and the board would be pleased to be able to, to approve it. And just uh, to tie to that comment, many towns have not adopted the option for having this uh, uh, and Scarborough has chosen to adopt uh, that option, which is great. That, that's correct. I was surprised to see it there. I, I would have said the chances of them getting this in any other town is pretty close to zero. So 
uh, we're, we're pleased to be in Scarborough. Again, Scarborough uh, has been, uh, we've gotten a bad rap over the years regarding building. And I gotta say, it's just wrong. The people, this is a town, it's a very easy town to work with. Um, what, what I have here on the board is uh, a picture of the, of the building that they're looking to build. Um, we've started this process and are looking to upgrade the whole site so that it meets the current design standards of the, of the town of Falmouth, both from the building point of view as well as landscape and parking. Um, and we think that, that overall this is going to be a great benefit to the church as well as to the, the, the community as a whole. Um, the church has been extremely successful in its mission and has a fair number of members and it's growing all the time. And we, we look to be able to expand so that we can cut down the number of services that we hold every, mo every Sunday morning and, and make it a, a more community with everyone there uh, at the same time versus having to come at staggered times. You don't get to meet the entire congregation. So that's the church look that, you, that we're going to put together. Obviously, that goes to the planning board, and the planning board will make that, that determination. wide through here. And that was done prior to this site plan 
and this site plan didn't pick it up, and we were, we purchased the property and believed the site plan was originally approved, and went through the mortgage survey and the deed and all of that, all reference the larger project, larger property that's out through here. That's, that's Did you also go to the planning board for that? Or? We did. Uh, this Wait. was originally approved by the planning board, and in 2015 we went and got some additional parking put back here, and a very slight addition put on the back here, a 12 foot wide addition. What was the year that that was done? Not the first, the, the, no, the other part. Uh, they, when, when you first went to the planning board? Uh, this went to the planning board, and then we went back to the planning board for additional parking, I believe, in 2015. How about the, the older one, the first time? 88, 1988. 1988, thank you. And the, the DOT took this right away in 66, and that was not picked up by either the, the original designer, uh, nor did we, because if you read the deed, the deed gives you this description. Too. How far down yeah. Warren Road does that uh, right away go? Uh, it goes all the way along right away. It, it, if you go through the DOT plans, um, several places they've widened it out in different different sides, and then it comes back to the original one and then widens back out. Um, in this particular location through here, it was widened to 100 feet. The reason we discovered the issue is we had a meeting with the town staff where the uh, town engineer is going through the Route, 1, the Route 114 improvement projects and the difference that they had on their plan was they had some stormwater management and the sidewalk that comes back onto our property pretty significantly. So what we did was put together, oops, yeah, this graphic. Which we think is the most telling graphic that is, that is, that's there. Um, the blue here is the town's plan for widening and improving Route 114. What we did was took their plan and lined up the survey items that, that were similar to ours. Uh, there's a hydrant out here, there's a telephone pole, there's a culvert, uh, the culvert crossing the road here. We lined those up to come up with the two plans and laid them one over the other. What you get is um, our boundary line is out here, and their boundary line is 12 feet further back in, in this location here. And so it, it makes our building non-conforming when you look at those boundary lines versus what we, what we had originally planned on if you put the deed together by the uh, deed description, the boundary by the deed description. So the, in, in our opinion, uh, we're asking for the practical variance because the condition was created by MDOT taking the right away, uh, not by anything that we did as the, as the applicant. We've been working closely with our neighbor, uh, Mr. Berg, who owns these properties here. Um, he's very much in favor of this project. He's granted us an easement along this edge to do some grading and landscaping and buffering along that edge that's on his property. Um, we think we fit into the neighborhood as a community service uh, that you would expect in any village. Uh, so we think we're in keeping with the character of the village by adding a new building and bringing it up to uh, current standards and making the landscaping and the environmental piece come together. We think we meet the uh, intent of the variance that we have a, we're not a detriment to the to the overall neighborhood. Um, one of the things that we would like to point out here, if you look at the setback for this building here, um, it's virtually the same as what our building would be if it were built in this configuration. So that when you drive down Route 114, you will see buildings the same distance back, which is keeping with the character of the neighborhood, and and unfortunately. Our neighbor here is built more in the back, away from the buildings, but but this is in keeping with what the character of the village is intended to be. Is right. that in the same zone? Uh, I believe they are. It, the intent was to keep the buildings out near the front and, and make them uh, pedestrian friendly. Um, what you see in this forum road improvement piece Is, is when they do the 114 improvement project, 
this is a sidewalk that they're building all the way along and they've pushed it back so that it's along the edge of the right of way and it's more pedestrian friendly. Uh, it'll be 10 feet wide so it can be plowed and maintained fairly easily in the winter time. Um, it's easier for bikes and pedestrians to use it so if you're a young bike rider uh, you might not want to ride in the traffic lane but, but it's out here. Uh, these islands in here will be stormwater management um, facilities that will help treat stormwater from the road. We're working with the town so that we can uh, cooperate with them and, and either participate with them in, in treating our stormwater in the same location to make it all work, which is why we got here. We found out this discrepancy. So we were, were pretty comfortable with that. Uh, all in all, um, we think we meet all of the criteria in the application. Uh, what I'd like to do is have Eric go through some of the church pieces and how it impacts the church, both in terms of its use and why we think it's uh, a benefit to, for the town to approve this practical marriage. Just one more question before I uh, let you. Yeah. Uh, has there been any talk about lights? I've, he I've heard numerous times about traffic lights there. Not that we. A traffic light? Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm just wondering what the status is on that. I honestly don't know. Yeah, we've, we've been working with a traffic engineer who's doing a traffic study and is sort of put on hold until we get this by this. But the um, information I have from the traffic study is it may trigger the warrants necessary for a traffic light for Sunday morning. All of the rest of the week, it doesn't. There's not enough traffic in and out in order to require the light. So the feeling is for the short period of duration for Sunday morning, that putting in a traffic light really isn't, isn't in the best interest of the community. Nobody wants to drive to work and stop for a light that, that there's nobody coming out of there. Um, so we, we think it's, it's not the right place to do it. Uh, there may be some other traffic demand management techniques that we can use in order to, to work through all those issues. Um, Thank you. One, one of the questions was whether or not the um, the shoulder on the far side is wide enough to create a little bit of a slip lane so that when you do get left hand turns coming in there, um, you can slide by on the right without creating, a, without creating a hazard. That's where we started dealing with the staff and we'll continue that through the planning board process. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eric Samuelson from the Rock Church. It's a privilege to be here with you all today. I want to thank you all uh, for your support. I church moved to the Scarborough community in 2011, and it's been a tremendous experience uh, for us as a church. And so uh, we really found that the combination between people, business, community, and township, it's been a great environment for our church. And I'm uh, very thankful to be here today. Uh, really what I would want to add to Mr. Greer's comments there were really two things when we moved into the facility uh, that were obviously deficient. The first was the, the construction of the facility that we moved into. Uh, that was a phase one uh, part of the plan. That's why it's set so awkwardly far back from the road. It doesn't match the, the business environment or even the current construction standards that would have that typical 30-foot setback. Uh, it was built that way with the intention for the facility to grow forward towards the road, build an expansion forward, and then have more parking spaces out back. So we really are trying to move forward with that plan, uh, bring the building more in line with some of the original intent that goes along with that. Uh, the one thing that you would not know, and that, that's pretty obvious uh, to you, I'm sure, even as you drive by on Route 114 regularly, uh, the one thing that you would not know is that inside the building, uh, they had actually, in many ways, I think, built it incorrectly. Uh, there was a lack of understanding of the use of space and facilities. Uh, they created a very large gathering space with a very small transition, entry, exit, what we would call fellowship space, and not really enough classrooms. Uh, those of you that have been in Scarborough for a significant amount of time, you know that uh, really there's been two churches that have been through that building. Uh, I wasn't here long enough to know exactly Oak Hill's history, uh, but I did see um, with what happened with Harvest Bible Chapel no longer being able to support that facility. And I don't think that helps the town, I don't think it helps the image, and it certainly doesn't help the property along the way. So we did major renovations inside the building. It took us a while to get to the outside. Uh, when we moved in, one of the Scarborough uh, folks joked that, hey, you got the largest dirt parking lot in town there, Eric. So we did what we could within two years to remedy that. 
paved the parking lot, but inside we had to balance the space to create the right amount of gathering space with transition and entryways and then room for classrooms. This building, as we have it designed, as we've worked with our architect and we've tried to make the most of the property that we have, um, follows that model. We want to follow the same success that you've seen uh, businesses across your town and, and other developments, whether they be residential or whether they be uh, apartments, but we want to follow that same model for success. And so this facility is built that way. It really does need to be balanced in terms of parking, in terms of large gathering space, classroom space for children, and the space for others in between. And so that's where, when uh, Mr. Greer talks about the impact that um, the 12 foot variance that we're asking for and the practical difficulty, that's where um, in some people's minds 12 feet may not seem significant, uh, but when we begin to dwell, draw 12 feet, so existing space, uh, the existing building as you know it uh, is in the back here and as we build out to the front, um, 12 feet as it begins to cut through seating areas, so really there's only three spaces to work with. There's the large gathering space that maybe you could cut into uh, if the variance was denied. There is the fellowship and, and kind of entry and exit way area that you could cut into, although that's a two-story facility, so every foot we take out of there, we actually lose two square feet because we would lose that in both first and second floor. And then you have really your non-negotiable space of bathrooms and hallways and um, facility and utilities type thing, and that, that space really can't be compromised or changed at all. So we only have the option of just flip it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Should work with my material. We only have the option of cutting through uh, the gathering space, which as you can see, when you begin to cut a 12 foot swap through there, that's about 170 out of 600 feet that would disappear. Uh, that's a 30% decrease in usable facility. Uh, and obviously for any organization to have a 30% decrease in effectiveness or efficiency, um, I'll talk in just a minute the real numbers that puts us outside of the ballpark. If we were to uh, move that to the, to the rear areas again, uh, it would be both upstairs and downstairs and we lose all of that transition space, all of that uh, space for people both entering and exiting the facility to be able to move. So uh, even, even any of the options of um, is there a way that the, that the church or that the design can change? Uh, we've maximized our lateral design of it, and if we begin to take, change the depth, begin to change the numbers in ways that we'll talk about uh, in terms of answering questions on the practical difficulty. So um, with that, I think those are the, the bulk of my comments. The rest of them will certainly come out in terms of uh, answering the questions on the practical difficulty variance. But the only final statement that I would make is obviously it is, it is our desire uh, to, to create a facility to make a, about a three and a half, three point two million dollar investment in Scarborough uh, that would allow this community to really match the standards of other facilities. Uh, when I drive by, whether it's Saco Biddeford Savings or Bank of America or Marsh Imaging, their setbacks from the road are the setbacks that we're asking for. I think that um, Tom Business did make that clear at one point uh, that we don't want, we're not asking for a setback that will put us closer to the road than typical businesses. Uh, we merely need a setback that would put us closer to the right-of-way. Uh, so well, the right-of-way is in, in a sense an imaginary line drawn across the front of our property. Uh, it would only change our distance from the right-of-way. It would not affect our distance to, to Gorham Road. Uh, in the same way, it works very well with uh, the diagrams that were shown for the Gorham Road Improvement Project. Uh, that sidewalk, our easement, has already been granted to the city of Scarborough for the sidewalk, and I think the new Gorham Road improvement, the sidewalk that, Gor that sorry, Gorham Road, the sidewalk that Scarborough is installing uh, will work very well with the front of this facility uh, when we add landscaping elements and the other design elements. Uh, I believe we meet the overall character and nature, uh, not only of the road, but all of Scarborough. Thank you. You bet. Uh, let me open the public hearing portion of this meeting. Anybody from the public wish to speak or bring up a deed? <laughs> no, I'm closing the public hearing part of the meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, why don't we come to the board for questions or comments or concerns? Yeah. Uh, currently, it's, you have a serious parking problem. And it's it's a real hazard on Sunday mornings. Now, you said that you wanted to eliminate some services and 
Or you create a larger service? Are you going to have one service or two services? Well, I expect that the community will still be multi-service. It really is uh, the best way to serve the community, both here in Scarborough and beyond. What will happen, the Gorm Road Improvement Project, no matter what, uh, as they improve the road there, roadside parking goes away. So that issue of roadside parking uh, will no longer be an issue. Okay, so you have to have enough we, parking. You bet. We have to have on-site parking or come up with our own. Enough to cover 600 seats. You bet. You bet. Or, and if, if we reach, and so generally, churches don't run absolutely full. Uh, we've been very thankful to have some good experiences like that. But when you reach those limits, and we have in the past, uh, we create, we come up with solutions to problems. Um, and so, yes, off-site parking, things like that, are possibilities. Uh, we've always, we, there have been times in the past when we used those before we actually paved uh, the parking lot, we were using off-site parking. Uh, so, with the Gorham Road Improvement Project, that roadside parking that you see will go away. And we're already working, and that's the great thing about working with Jay Chase uh, and Angel on this. We already have that agreement, and so what we've put in place is if you uh, allow us this and we're able to approve the practical variance, uh, we have a series of uh, mitigation steps for exactly those questions. What, why don't you put the uh, expansion on the other side of the building? So the expense of that uh, is extraordinary because that would require uh, renovations to the whole back half of this. Um, the back half of this works very well for what we're going to use it for, classrooms, children's space. Uh, we'll have uh, really less than $100,000 worth of renovations. If we try to do that on the back half, um, one, we, we can't park out here. We can't create this into parking lot. We don't get the same parking up front that we get out back. Or we lose those essential parking spots. Uh, Why can't you park parking out front? We, well, one, it's not Scarborough parking standards, so we would need to change um, the, just in terms of our town, uh, our, our current town standards. Want parking in the back and facilities, entryways, and windows up front. So we're building to that, but we end up with less parking. Um, and the expense, we end up renovating, instead of creating an environment for the community where people can meet, uh, we end up renovating the back at high expense and also creating that same awkward facility uh, that's all behind the building and no longer the, the appealing um, front. And Tom walked away with that. But no longer creating an environment for Scarborough uh, that's attractive, we would maintain that same construction front from 1988 and image that's far below uh, current town standards. So I do feel it's a benefit both to the church in terms of economics, uh, the cost of renovations and the construction out back, and also to the city in terms of creating a very similar environment. The upgrades to Wentworth, uh, the way Scarborough School appears, we'd love to be at that same character in this town. Thank you. Procedurally, I'm trying to understand why they come to us before the planning board. I mean, this is a rather large expansion. If we pass them, are they going to the planning board after this? Um, I mean, it seems like a large expansion with a lot of wear and tear and on the roads, and you're talking about putting in lights and increasing traffic to one time. We're not basing our decision on that at all. But I mean, under the criteria, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces to this, and it's easy for the Board of Appeals to insert itself into that process. My recommendation is that's not your job. Your job is to determine whether or not they have met the practical difficulty criteria for a reduction in their setback to the right of way. That's all we really need to concentrate on. The planning board site plan review process will take care of all of the the other minutiae and details as far as lighting and parking spaces and, and all of that stuff. That's not, you can't involve yourself in that because there's no way you'd ever get to a decision on the, so on the setback. Where they've already gone to the planning board, so why are they here first? The planning, the planning board they've already board. gone, you, you, you've met with the planning board. So we've met with planning board, started the process, uh, but obviously, without the variance, it would radically change the nature of this process. And actually, what, what I would say today is we would be unable to do this. Um, that loss of seats, that loss of revenue, and, and again, we'll do the math in a minute, um, makes this project undoable. And so 
there's no nothing to pursue with planning board. We do have a lot of conversations ahead with planning board. Um, we've already worked together, and there are certainly some bumps, but the way that it integrates with the Gorham Road Improvement Plan, um, there is some potential for it to be a real benefit to both sides. Other questions? Comments? Um, number one, congratulations on the success of your church. It's really grown astronomically. I've been in the building. I agree with you. It does have limitations. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, it maxes out, any church will max out at about 70 80% of seats. Yes, you are correct. So there would never be 600 adults in that building at one time. It is a weird phenomenon that churches, it's like a, it'll stop no matter how many seats, they'll meet the seats, whatever the reason is. I don't know. I know that because I just know that. <laughs> it's a weird, it just is. That's, that's absolutely correct. It's not a movie theater. Uh, the culture and the relationships of people inside, there needs to be space for those relationships to happen. And uh, so it's a community, not, not, a, not a venue. Um, I, if you could help me, uh, well, why don't I ask if you have any comments first? <coughs> No, um, my comments in, in the staff comments that I distributed to the board and to the appellants were simply that I wanted to make sure that the board understood the nuances of, of the 1966 MDOT plan. We didn't actually have a plan of that in the packet. There's several um, pieces that sort of get to it, but not, not quite illustrate exactly how that right-of-way um, came to that property and then widened up to 100 feet. That, that's the whole crux of the problem is that that 100 foot right of way is now what's creating this issue. And I want to make sure that the board understood that that's, uh, and I think Eric, you said it real, really well in that um, you're, not, you're not asking to be closer to the road, but you are asking to be closer to the right of way because that right of way line, it's a little, bit of a mystery to me how so much planning got done before it was ever discovered that the right way was actually 100 feet wide there. So it may be the, uh, right, <coughs> that had the Gorham Road Improvement Plan never been run, um, we wouldn't be in this place, but certainly the detail um, that Scarborough has gone into to create that plan has certainly brought to light all of the boundary issues and property markers in that. Yeah, our, our titles, which are in your, um, in your packets, with several different easements and right-of-ways, uh, including the right for the previous owner to come and harvest hay on the back of the property. Uh, but no mention of Maine DOT owning a significant chunk uh, of real estate up front, and so that's why, uh, very surprising to us. Can I stop you there? That's actually one of the questions I have. Maine DOT doesn't own that strip. They have a right-of-way over or under that strip. Is that correct? The, their right of way, they, they have ownership rights. Or yeah. I don't know if anyone actually owns the road, but yeah, I mean, as far as ownership as we understand it, that, that's what that right of way depicts is what they have use of, what they have ownership of. Who's, who pays taxes on that? Oh, I would guess we do, don't we, Mark? We all do. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that point what are you trying? Is this a learning moment? <laughs> I'm actually trying to get a learning moment for myself. Because uh, as we know, we, we just did a right of way across the, the uh, school, mm -hmm. uh, right across the right. whatever it is. Yet, we didn't say that that's now two separate properties, we just have a right of way. To I have a right of way on my property, but yet I use my setback. It's not from my right of way, it's my driveway, it's the people beside me. My, right of, my setback is from the actual property line. Mm -hmm. Yet there's a right of way for a road going right up my driveway, but beside my property. But when we built the building, we could build it all the way to the, to not to the right of the driveway, but to the right of the way based on the plot. I'm confused as to what the difference is here than, than what I thought was SOP. I've got a teaching moment for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we can go back to the, the previous appeal um, where the attorney um, so kindly read the definition of lot lines. Okay. Where, where the front lot line meets the road right of way is the front lot line. And so if that road right of way all of a sudden takes a jog in towards the property and then, and then heads on down the road, that's your front <coughs> property line. So their front property line 
Is it the entire width of the property? That yes, it, it is. Yeah. It starts at the eastern edge and extends all the way out and beyond. To so the, the property di directly... Um, the east of us toward Green Needle yes. range is standard property line just a few feet from the edge of road. That's like 60, is that a 66 foot wide right of way at that point? Or is it 80? Maybe it's more like that. Yeah, that's, that's the, this, this boundary right here when it comes out, this is the boundary line of our neighbor right here and then it steps back yeah. and comes out. That's exactly here. what I was I wanted the board to understand yeah. is how that behaves there on that on that road. Right, and 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 we picked it up when we met with the town staff as to exactly where that was. Um, the DOT right of way shows this being 100 feet wide in here and only 50 feet wide up here, um, and it's a little confusing as their boundary line on the 50 feet wide was actually further closer out to the pavement edge on the DOT plan than it was. Than, than this right of way line. So there's sort of like three lines there. Um, and if you go out and make a search of it, there's actually a pin on this this piece here, which would lead you to believe that that's the right of way consistent. It's, it's rare that the DOT right of way line actually steps back like that. Did they ever monument the, 20, the additional 25 foot? Not that we can back. tell. Okay. No. So that, that additional 50 feet is divided between both sides of the road. So yes. it means a 25 foot additional in, increase in, in depth of right of way on your property. And then to the property uh, to the west of yours, is that, um, does that step back in again and go or does that 100 foot continue? I have the, the 66 plans with me in small scale if you want to look at them. Uh, no, I just, I, I'm, I'm just exactly. interested. It, it, I, it continues up the, up the way. They, they obviously widened it where they thought they were going to need right away. And okay. when you get to here, this begins to drop off, mm -hmm. especially in, in 66. And then there's the culvert crossing and, and there are wetlands on both sides. So my suspicion is they went along and said, back in this area, it's all developed. We really don't need any more right away. We can keep where we are. But from here on, we're going to get it. And if it was was reasonably open and easy to obtain. They did. You know, all this was undeveloped. So, I don't know how to teach one more. Sure. Have you gone back to the DOT and asked them to return? We have. We actually what went was back. the response? Yeah, we asked to buy it. We asked to, what we asked for was to buy this strip back from them and then provide them an easement to do whatever they wanted on it. So essentially, we would own it and then step back, would move out, and they would give an easement. And the answer was no, pretty, pretty clear no. Uh, so we, we <coughs> even more emphatic than that. <laughs> it was. <laughs> what was their reason? Um, they don't sell right away. <laughs> it was it was pretty clear cut. That Once they take that. it, they don't want to give it, it back. It was pretty abrupt. Even even if even if all practical purposes they had the same rights to it that they have now, we were willing to do that. The answer was no. So, so like in, in all of our other districts, our setbacks are to the right of way or to the property line. In, in that's not not the road, not the center line or anything else. It's always the property line. So if they if they own an extra 25 feet in, then our set our required setback for that zone starts there. And could you explain the difference between easement and right of way? Um, I think what I'm thinking of is easement as opposed to right of way. Because they drew it, if they wanted to go across the pro back of that property, which an easement is given is given by someone. It's given if I give you an easement over my property, I'm allowing you either access or or, or I give you an easement for whatever use you know you're you're requesting. I still own the property underneath it. I just can't impede your ability to use that easement space. For whatever That's purpose right. it's given. So that, that helps me explain. So right away is different. There's no setback to an easement. Okay. Thank you. I will remember some questions for teachable moments, right? If you'd like one, one quick one more. All of the old right aways for DOT up to a certain point, and I'm going to say someplace in the 60s, used to be easements. And if you went and looked, the property of butters home to the middle of the road, but DOT took an easement over the top of it and essentially took it. Um, since then, they, they actually own the property and take rights to it. And, and when they do 
reconstruction projects, they actually go back and file new deeds to own them, actually own the property. And in their mind, if they have an easement over it, they own it. There's, you can't do anything without their permission. And they don't compensate the people that they... No. Ooh. no. Oh. But that's, that's they, they consider that when they took it originally, even though it's an, it was an easement and they were all the old deeds, they owned it. Okay. <laughs> Brian, what is the setback? What they, is the setback? Yeah, what is the setback that they want to decrease down 12 feet? In one of my in one of my documents, I think I had that outline. Do you know what it is? Yeah, we were it's a 30 foot minimum front yard setback. Correct. We were hoping to reduce that down to 15 feet. So you're looking for a 10 foot? Uh, 15 foot. 15 foot. I'm sure. So what's the 12 <laughs> foot? What's the 12 feet? So there'll be three feet from the edge of the building to the uh, setback. It, it, there's a slight buffer there, as opposed to bringing it right to inches. Uh, we'll give ourselves feet from where we stop the construction of our building. Uh, so you want a 15 foot setback? Correct. Or reduction? Setback. Reduction to 15, right. And we want you don't want to have to come back and ask for a variance for an encroachment into the into the setback. So that gives us a couple of other questions from the board. Um, it's in the R four zone, but it's not changed. It's not one of those ones. It's all the funky yeah. ones. It's still R four. And this is a place of worship, which is a permitted use in all of our residential zones. I know my children what worship means, but be true. Okay, here we go. Why don't we go through the why don't we go through the requirements and we'll go from there, okay? <laughs> uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. If you'd like to read in your right for the record, that would be So great. there's a significant amount of uh, writing that we've placed in here. If you want me to condense and then we can expand from there. But in the second paragraph, uh, the unique significance of the property was reduced in size based on the MDOT taking in 19, 90, 1966. Uh, this enlarged main DOT right of way for this lot, but not for the adjacent lot to the east, um, it, and creates uh, neighboring conditions that do not, let me say that again, uh, this will create this, it, the variance will create the same setback as other businesses. And when did the town discover that issue? Is it the same time you guys discovered? So they discovered it first because they had the Owen Haskell drawings for the Gorham Road Improvement Project. Do you know when that was? Just <coughs> a month and a half ago. Okay, so it's recent. Yes. Okay. The, the plans have been in the works for longer than that. But the, the, the realization of putting the two and two together came about a month and a half. When we put our expansion plan on top of their existing improvement plan, that's when it came to life. Okay, thanks. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably de de detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting property. Okay. Again, I would start with the second paragraph. Uh, our current facility does not conform to the most recent Scarborough building and design standards. A $3.2 million expansion will dramatically improve curb appeal and community image. Similarly, the new construction will be consistent with standards of landscape, design, uh, closer to the road location as current building standards dictate. This design is in close coordination with the Gorham Road Improvement Plan, including sidewalk access and careful mitigation uh, of traffic concerns as coordinated with the city. And the practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Again, the existing building uh, in its location, which was intended to have an expansion out front, um, was built without the knowledge of uh, the, the constriction that would be caused by the right-of-way. And the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties. Okay. We missed question four. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant, except the exception. And again, this goes back to uh, the use of the facility and the ability 
for it to carry the economic resources to continue for this community to grow and so without the variance the proposed expansion will lose thirty percent of its building capacity the economic impact it is an estimated loss that would turn out at about a hundred and seventy thousand per year per service so even in a two service format three hundred forty thousand dollars a year when it comes to borrowing money for the toward the construction and or capital campaign raising it's really two times annual income as your borrowing rate so it would effectively have about a one point nine million dollar impact and there's no way for us to offset that without the variance and then we'll go to the variance that would result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding property you bet and I would start in the middle of that paragraph the Rock Church expanding the Rock Church toward Gorham Road will include all the design elements and construction standards that fully meet Scarborough business community including architecture materials design and landscaping granting the variance will allow the structure to be at normal setback distances for properties along that section of route 114 with respect to the edge of pavement this meets the goal of the town site plan ordinance and providing better street frontage and the granting of the variance will not have an advent I'm sorry unreasonably adverse effect on the net natural environment you bet this second census various will allow us to improve the natural environment will finally add trees landscaping improving drainage impact on stormwater I will actually add stormwater treatment which will improve the care of the environment in addition to working together with Scarborough's improvement plan the scope of the drainage and the culvert will be done in close coordination with the town's improvement plan making better use of environmental and engineering and mitigation to improve the current system and you're not in a flood zone or flood hazard area or outside of flood and shoreline zones and on the dimensional standards those provisions of this ordinance which relate to the lot area lot coverage frontage and setback including buffer requirements the practical difficulty of case where strict application of the dimensional standards of this ordinance to property for which the variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant you bet which I think you kind of tied in do you want to elaborate on that at all not at all exactly that it precludes the ability of the church to use the property that it has and certainly the economic impact is obvious when we talk about the financial impact it would have thank you we've opened the public hearing already at board member questions comments concerns I have a lot by the way um question two the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an adversely detrimental effect on either the use of fair market values or buying properties there is nothing that looks like this down there this does not conform to what's there this is mostly residential this would conform very well to route one this doesn't conform down there it's going to definitely change the neighborhood um three I'm sorry four no other feasible alternative you've mentioned some feasible alternatives that are present I mean they're monetary we can't decide on whether you're losing or gaining monetary dollars based on that there are feasible alternatives that I see um question five granting variance for result and bringing the applicant's property more nearly in conformance with surrounding properties again I don't believe that's the case on both sides there's apartment houses there's buildings I live one street down there's nothing like this in any of that area and I think on question six it's going to have an adverse effect on the natural environment because in the winter time there's deer that migrate across route one I mean across Gorham Road and that's natural environment right there now it's not paved it's going to be paved where your area that you're talking about I see them from my back part you guys see them from my house they go right through there as we go back with parking lot into the woods they go between the back with parking lot so I have a lot of concerns with this I mean I appreciate the right concern and I think that was kind of why I was asking about the planning board because typically the planning board will say this looks good um and so I don't normally have this many that I think it doesn't mean the members I'll take it I'll take mine I can't if you want 
Um, we are, I'm just going to go with the ones you mentioned, the change. Uh, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably de detrimental effect on either the use of fair market value of the abutting properties. Right now it's a metal box. Um, I don't believe it's metal. It's metal? No, I think. So the facility itself is, if it obviously has siding on it, but it was constructed as a metal building. True. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's bad looking, but uh, I mean, the town has been talking about driving things closer to the road. I kind of consider this part of the high school area rather than part of the. To me, it, 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 we're seeing everything kind of pushed down, and I, I kind of think of it as the Oak. I consider this still as the Oak Hill area, which is one of the reasons I asked about the zoning question whether it changed zones. Um, there's. My biggest concern is something that I'm not going to get into. It's not per, not appropriate uh, for my mentor. Is um, the parking issue, which I do think is a problem on on, on Route 115. Uh, if that alone was solved, I feel I feel much more comfortable about this project all by itself. Um, I have a problem. This is a philosophical problem, but uh, it's not a legal problem with the fact that the, a piece of land that can't really be used is being penalized against you. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. It's not, it doesn't register because it's, they can dig it up. It's plenty of room and they only, they're only going to dig it up or make tar out of it. And look what they did on Route 1 on the other side where they took everybody's yards and didn't think twice about it. So it's, it's hard to see there was a lot of care going into the DOT's making decisions as they will take what they want when they want, as we've already established. So, to me, it's not going to interfere with that because it's outside of that area. And they may, in fact, widen that and they'll do whatever they darn well please. So, to me, I, I don't see a huge issue with that. I, I would have considered that as drive-by as their land, whether or not a piece of paper said otherwise or not. Um, I think it's important um, to have buildings not deteriorate mm -hmm. and that we improve our areas. So to me, when it, I see the Grand Advance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, it's a church, it'll still be a church, but it'll be a church with the design standards that the town has implemented. Even though it's not the design standards, oh, it is actually, it's the design standards, Those. A lot of those condos down there are 40 years old, 35 years old, so they don't fall in. If, if you wanted to do that same condo project today, you couldn't do that. It'd have to be different. So what they, eventually that will be changed, and I don't, and anything for that matter, going down that road. I also do agree with the fact that it brings it more in conformance with the, the concept of, I don't agree with this necessarily, but bringing the buildings closer to the road. I, I'm not, I can tell you flat out, I'm not a fan of that concept. But that being said, that is the design standard. And so to me, it does meet that design standard. And I don't think whether this church has got on the front of it uh, more space or not, I don't see how it really changes anything. And if in fact the design standards are what the town expects, the, design, the, the town didn't say, on this section, we don't want you to use the design standard. We want you to use this design standard. They said, these are the design standards. So they didn't really seem to care much about the neighborhood <laughs> back and forth. They said, the this is what our design standards are. And I think they are in keeping with that design standard. I also think that it's really purview of the, of the planning board. Um, I'll never forget the Mercedes dealership and the butt ugly blue roof that came up during the planning board meeting. It's, it's, that's really the job of the planning board. Ours is to be able to let, allow them to go to the next step and if the planning board does not believe that this is able to support the facility, can, can handle it, then they'll make that call. But I, I don't think we should be the, I, I don't see that, that being an item reached to that level. As far as um, the variance is unique, I'm going to go right through them. The, the uh, need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not the general condition of the neighborhood. 
I think that's a fact. It is a, it, it, the property was put on there. Uh, I don't remember when it was built, um, but it was put up quickly and and initially rather shoddily. But they did do a nice job trying to fill it in, and you know, the different churches that have been there have improved it as it's gone along. This is a major change. Uh, but if you also look at the design standards of Great American Neighborhoods, there's always a core building that surrounds that, and it's in the past been a church. It has since morphed to other items, but in reality, the, great, the whole concept of the Great American Neighborhood or the Village Center neighborhood is surrounded by a unique and solid building, and we can go back to, you can look anywhere, you can look at Portland, you can look at the Great American Neighborhood up there, you can look at all of these, the, 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 the design standards that are currently being used by the state of Maine, and it not necessarily encompass a church, but encompass a building that has a presence that sets the tone. I, so I think that's consistent. Um, the practical difficulty is not a result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I think that goes without saying. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Obviously, if the town didn't know about this thing, I don't know how they could. Um, no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except the variance. They could go backwards. Uh, that certainly would be an option. It would be inconsistent with the goals of of the of the uh, design standard. Uh, and it would mean that you'd have a very nice looking back end of the building and a continually less than nice looking front of the building. So I don't think, I don't see that as a game. And having been in that building, uh, I don't belong to that church, I've been in that building. Uh, so I've, I've got no, there's nothing there for me. That I've got no reason to say, oh, it's, it needs to be that way because I, I go to that church, I don't. Um, but I do know that facility, and I do know that it's kind of a hodgepodge back there, and I don't think that the original planners <coughs> ever anticipated seeing the volume that's grown out of that. Um, and like I said earlier, I commend you for that. It's hard to do uh, by any standard. Um, so uh, The next one, number five, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties. Um, I, I think that uh, Mr. Crockett's dead right when you look at it from the left and to the right. Um, I can't disagree with that logic. I don't view that as a as the area, though. I, I view the Oak Hill area as where that speed limit slows down as kind of a 35 mile an hour zone. That is, in my opinion, the transition of the neighborhood going from uh, one set of standards to a second set of standards, which is bringing you into the Oak Hill area. And if you think about the ball fields and the school and what was actually looking at at one point as being a hockey rink and all of that stuff, I, I see that as the area. Do I think it affects um, the immediate properties? Of course it does. It's next door to them. Uh, does it affect the, uh, number one, is it negative? I, I don't see it as negative, I see it as an improvement uh, because we're bringing it more closely to the design standards of the future. And uh, I think there's some serious water problems in that neighborhood, uh, both, uh, what's the road there that goes, the one that has a lot of challenges. Uh, that near there? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's probably going to have to be addressed in the master plan. Is that the village of Oak No, uh, that road. Is down the down the down the down the down the road. Sawyer Road? Not Sawyer, but the one that's... Uh, next one. Next one. It's, 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 it's a dead end street. Green Needle. Yeah, that's Sawyer. Green Needle. Green Needle. Green Needle. That's a yeah. That doesn't see the flood. What sees the flood is the village of Oak Hill. When you get heavy rainfall, the doesn't get it anywhere near as bad. As, and that's going to be right so directly behind them. <coughs> rainfall, the road at the village of Oak Hill is completely washed up. Right. But that's the positive of this, is that's going to have to be addressed. Because by doing this project, 
planning board is going to have to deal with that, that issue. And that issue needs to be dealt with. And I know people on Green, Hill, uh, Green Needle that say it's the other way around, and I know people on the condos that say it's the other way around. But it's going to end up on their lap, I have a feeling, because they're going to have to deal with that issue. Runoff is going to be an issue. And having experienced that when I built my building, I had to take care of most of the county uh, with the equipment that I had to put in. So I, I know what they're going to do to them. I, I, I can tell you what they're going to do. They're going to be a lot of water mitigation that's going to have to be. Well, to Mrs. Schiff's point, it would be better if it had come from the planning board to us for the recommendations mm -hmm. so we could see what they're going to do because I can't answer these questions well, the, without information on, I mean, that, you just brought up a huge point. It's going to have a detrimental effect on the environment with the water. But can, can I add but, to that comment real quick? I mean, Ms. Greer indicated that they are upgrading the stormwater management standards and bringing them to be more conforming. Is that correct? That's correct. Am I interpreting correctly? So I'll, I'll just insert my other point real quick. Right, right. Okay. I'll, then I'll cease my interruption. Um, you free to interrupt as much. So my, I would say my my finding of fact of, you know, Mr. Greer indicated that they are upgrading the stormwater management standards in that area. Also, finding of fact that, and again, this pertains, this pertains to my my other concern, which was mitigated in the discussions that you know the parking issue and the traffic issue that's there with the cars along the road. That the traffic study is to be performed, but after they are granted or not granted um, approval of this appeal, because then they then they have the actual footprint which they can construct the facility. Um, so the traffic study and and you know the traffic mitigation and so on that'll happen after the determination of the appeal. There is a time too, and there is a process where the, town, the planning department comes back with a recommendation to us that doesn't happen to be this. This, this uh, criteria. But normally, you're right, there is a situation where they'll come back and they'll give us a recommendation and it goes back again, but that's not the case here. Uh, but again, I'll, 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 if you go underneath the, if, when you put impervious surface up, uh, I've got five foot half pipes, uh, 180 feet long by 70 feet wide, um, that, uh, like I said, most of Cumberland County is protected by my building. So, I get it. It's, it's going to be expensive and they're going to have to deal with it yeah. because DEP is not going to let you off the hook and there is a problem there. So I see it as actually being a positive uh, for that neighborhood because it, it's not going to be, they're not going to tolerate that with the impervious surface. But you probably have already had that conversation. Right, right. That's what we're creating with stormwater drainage and runoff. Uh, going to have to those numbers. Which I believe will solve two neighborhoods' problems. It may not eliminate them, but it will certainly solve them. It will make them less likely to be a problem by default, and that's it. DP's not going to get worse. Um, so that that's why I'm okay with that, and just sheer experience, I know what happens. Um, the, the uh, where was it? She's alternative uh, number six. The so grand advantage will not really un, un, unreasonably adverse affect the natural environment. Uh, every time we cut a tree down, we affect the natural environment. Uh, just as the way of the world. The magic word is unreasonable. Um, if uh, they could do the cutting of the trees now, and that would be okay, I believe, whether they did it or not. Um, so I don't see that as a as a trigger issue. Does it open it up a little bit more to the people in that neighborhood? I don't know how far back the trees go back in there. I don't know, I don't know how deep that forest is in that area. It's pretty deep. It's pretty deep. So, I, so I don't see it affecting anybody per se. Um, and I think a lot, as you go back down, it's pretty wet. Um, but there are many trees there anyways. Yeah, they are. And, and there's also vernal pools back there. So there's a whole, there's, I've, I've walked it before and there's a whole set of, there's a bunch of vernal pools, there's a bunch of stuff back there that's all wet. And so again, I don't see that as being an issue. Uh, the last one, the, the strict, uh, application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance uh, to the property for which this variance is sought would both preclude it. And this is probably what I really would lay my hat on. Um, for, I don't know if that's the right expression, but it's one I'm using today. Um, the, uh, it would preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. The reality is that 
uh, as with any, and I'm not, I don't mean this in a derogatory term, but any business, you've got to be able to serve the needs of your clients. And the clients demand a certain level of space. And if the space is allowed, then the clients have the right to be able to do that. The alternative is to have another non-taxable piece of property on another piece of Scarborough land with another church, which I really don't think. You know, I'm all for more churches, but I'm, I'm synagogues and anybody else wants to build something. But every time that happens, it's non-taxable. This, is not, this property is already non-taxable, so there's no harm, no fault. And in fact, it's going to make uh, it, it will probably be, it, it needs it. I know what happens on that, I, I get the concept, I understand the philosophical concept and the reality concept of you've got to meet a certain size to, to meet your needs, and they do have a need, and they do have the means, and they do have, uh, so it does, absolutely, there is an economic impact. We don't like to talk about that with churches, but the reality is uh, churches have to meet the payroll. So, I, I just don't have a problem with any of it. That, that's where I'm sitting on it. Um, I take a totally different view of this thing. Uh, if they had the same and dot uh, right away as their next door neighbors, they wouldn't even be in here. They wouldn't be talking to us. We wouldn't have to be going through all these questions. Consequently, as far as I'm concerned, we accept it as is. Just because the MDOT took 25 feet or whatever it is, okay. You know, if they didn't do it, they wouldn't be talking to us. So why are we even bothering talking about a building that looks like a metal box? That's the planning board's decision to do. Our decision is should it be set back this number of feet or that number of feet? No, I don't. So I'm confused. Where do you stand on it? Well, I agree with what they're requesting. That's what I'm... So we're on the same page. I just talk more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just don't want to go through all those questions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that they make any difference. <laughs> Other members of the board wish to... <laughs> I would like to agree with Mr. Blaze and everything I can. <laughs> uh, I agree this is not a circumstance that you created. The MDOT has put you in this position. But in order to prove this, we still have to go through the questions and we need to, from a legal standpoint, be able to pass the straight face test. I like Mr. Blaze. I know. That's the quick and simple. But seeing as I'm the guy that always struggles with <laughs> practical difficulties because of the questions that have to be answered, I'm struggling on two of the points. Mm -hmm. The first one, the need for the variance is unique to this property and not the general condition for the neighborhood. If you look west, that doesn't hold any water at all because everybody on that side is now, at least for some distance, is well, dealing with 100 feet. I'm going to its war. <laughs> they're, they're all at 100 feet. So that's not unique. Everybody else going that way has 100 feet for how far? Do we have a feel for that? It's a okay. 100 feet set back from the center, or 50 feet per right right away. 100 foot right away. Right? <laughs> Almost all the way down the corner. Now, if you go the opposite way, towards Oak Hill, that's when it changes back 50 feet and everybody else deals with 25. So to say it's unique to this property, I struggle with. Because going west, it's not unique to this property. Because it says the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of this property. Right. And not the general condition of the neighborhood. Sorry to interrupt you, but it's unique because it's situated between where it changes. I would think that exactly makes it unique. Well, and I might argue that saying the rules apply to this property, and just because they're adjacent to another property doesn't change the circumstance when I look west. It's in the area that goes west, so it follows the same rules to me as the people to the west. It's too bad you're next to the guy. It's 50 feet. Now you wouldn't argue, you wouldn't argue that because that, I, like I view it as part of the Oak Hill. To me it's the start of Oak Hill. Yeah. Um, as opposed to that. Uh, and, and I say it's the end of Oak Hill. It's the first property going west. Which side of it? Uh, east is Oak Hill. <laughs> west, 
Okay, so you're saying that's the demarcation of the DOT. Yeah, because they now have the DOT right away of 100 feet wide. But where is the, uh, where is the speed limit change? No, I don't know what you're talking about for speed limit change. It changes all the way through. Yeah. No, it's 35 yeah. all the way through. 35. All the way down. Okay, I'm, I'm not arguing your distance from the road. <laughs> that's, that's, I get in the question of that as well. Okay. Someone comes running out of the front of the building, they're right on 114. I get that. But I can't change that. As the board member, I have to answer the question that I have. So, so go ahead, please. So for us, what's unique for us is it is right on the demarcation line, truly, and so it puts us right on the edge of um, the zone leading towards Wentworth and others who do have similar designs. And, and, and this is not the design I would do if this was my city, right. uh, but it's not my town. Right. And so we've done our best to match that. What may be unique to, the, to it is that the building is existing. Um, we're not trying to um, create a property that didn't exist. And what we're trying to do is finish a plan that, and so the building that's existing is what's driving us in a direction. But you're so adding that would be for our variance, or adding Correct. for variance on the new piece of building. Correct. So, I'll go to my question four. Question four is, no other feasible alternative exists to the applicant. You, do nothing is always an option. And I'm not saying that you should go in that direction because stagnation is not growth. Correct. So I'm supporting something new, but in order for me to pass this one, it says no other feasible alternatives exist, and I think they do. So let me explain my position. You want to go within 15 feet of the existing quote unquote property line. Instead of 30, you want to be back. We want to go 30 feet. We, we want, what we're really asking for is standard setbacks. If we didn't have the, if the right of way didn't extend, we are asking for a way standard setback. Right. But I can't change. Feet. But I can't change 30. that. You've got the setback that you have now. So my and I know that you've got a limit because the backside is coming up against an existing building. You're trying not to razz that existing building. You want to work within that envelope. My question to the architect is: Did you consider going wider? By taking off 15 feet on the on the front of the property, it affects you by 15 or 1600 square feet. Can you go wider on the wings? and still get viewing angle to the front of the building so that you can still have a good service, you can still affect the people the way you want to, but going out roughly 10 feet wider and bringing the front face back 15. Sure. I'm, I'm the civil engineer, not the architect, yeah. but I'll, right, I'll take a shot at that anyway. Um, the architect has made this thing wider and wider and wider because of the setbacks. The original design that we came up before they looked at any setbacks was actually a, a, a longer addition. And because of the setback that we were dealing with, or thought we were dealing with, it, it became wider and wider. And what drives the width is actually uh, losing the parking spaces on these sides in order to get the traffic circulation can't go any wider. Why can't you go back with traffic? Why can't you add another row or two in the rear of the property? Back, back here? Yep. We can. And there's been some discussion with the planning board as to whether or not that was going to be required as part of the going through it or not. And they're waiting for the traffic study to determine whether we have enough space. We have plenty of parking spaces to meet the That's not the issue. By, by going wider, I, I do a quick sketch on yep. what you have. I went wider and used roughly 28 spaces. By going back two more rows, you gain almost 50 spaces. So you would lose 28 up front, but you gain 50 in the back. And that's low cost construction. I'd much rather level a parking lot and put pavement in than I would to rather the building and do something more detrimental. So again, I don't want to make you go wider, but to me, that's a feasible alternative. Until you consider that, I would have to vote no, because there's a way of getting around this, I believe, without impacting that front setback. How would you deal with the structure? It's a new structure. No, I mean, okay, you're not, okay, I should stop. Okay. I'm just talking the front new building. Okay. Moving the front face back on? 15 feet and moving the sides out about 12, look like about 12. And I gain that same square footage that doesn't necessarily get you what you need. But the viewing angle now gets wider by about 15 to 20 degrees. So does that still serve the congregation well? Can I challenge you on a couple of things? Yeah. I'm not an architect, dude. Don't ask me. No. Number one, this is called the village at Oak Hill. Yeah. Hint. 
<laughs> my argument that that's part of Oak Hill. Number two, if you look right across the street, even the DOT's building, I think it's CMP or whatever the building is that's there, is the exact same distance from the road as the proposed church would be. And the three houses going down are either even with or closer to, in one case, more than halfway in. So if you look on that side, and by the way, it's the north. <laughs> Excuse me. But if you look, but if you look at these houses that are here, you, you get the DOT building, which sits back the same distance as that proposal. That's right across the street. Yeah. You look at the house that's next door to it. That sits right at the corner. It's dead on. You look at the next house. That one is it's where the part where its driveway is. It's next. If you look at the green roofed house, it's almost three quarters of it. it. It looks like it's only 30 feet in, and you don't get to uh, you don't get to a house way down outside of the village of Oak Hill um, until you get down to this last home uh, down here. So my question is to that: Did they get approval to construct that much closer to the road if the right of way was at 130? The road width right away. My guess is nobody nobody knew about number one, I think you are only gonna have that right of way on one side. So I guess it wasn't an issue. And if they did, they didn't know about it, just like the town didn't know about it. <coughs> so it's hard to blame the town didn't know about it. I think we did. But you know, ignorance of the law Oh it's true. It's not an excuse. But they're there. Oh I know. Those three, I those, those three houses are there. I can't go back and push those building back that building back, but if they wanted to do an addition. And I understand you already out of compliance. How are you going to get more closely in compliance? Right. But I guess if the argument is bringing it into more performance, which number did you pick? You, you uh, one in four. One, nice one in four. So one, the need for variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property, not the condition of the neighborhood. Well, in fact, it is the property because I, I'm not sure how you would... What's the condition that's different on this property than the one right next to it going towards core, which I guess is not one? Um, well, I can't tell. It looks like some water. It looks like there's some. Uh, I don't know this. It'd be a good question. I'm that talking in theory, Mr. Chairman. What's uh, the difference? I think if most they of it's wetlands. To the front. I think most of it's wetlands and the difference on that. I think that may have a unique circumstance that yeah. they're dealing with, right? This one doesn't have one. Yeah. That's so, what I'm saying. But I would say that the, the unique circumstance yeah, of the property is it doesn't meet its needs. It could go back. I mean, there's a bunch of ways you could do it. What's the most practical way? And I don't want to defend them, but I'm just looking at it from the point of view of, of if you look at the neighborhood as a whole, it would be consistent with the neighborhood as a whole, barring this middle end lane, which is a property that I don't know why they didn't develop over earlier, and barring the condos, everything else is within exactly where they want to be. So it's, it's there, if you look at this picture here, I'm not arguing with question yeah. two, which is character, uh, right, in neighborhood. I'm not arguing that at all. Right. I agree with that. My issue, again, was around one and four, which is what's the unique cir circumstance of this property Yep. and not the general condition of the neighborhood? I think the other problem is... Your Honor. <laughs> the other problem is with the feasibility. I, 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 my guess is they probably looked at different plans, but we'd have to ask them. Uh, right now we're just ignoring them, but <laughs> um, I, I would believe that this has probably been looked at as the, what, what's the most efficient, reasonable way to accomplish something, and not put people in jeopardy from a driving point of view, traffic point of view, everything else. And again, the planning board's going to deal with that anyway. Right. So they may come back and say, you know, you can. They, they may come back with a totally different design, as far as we know. But to me, that, that the property can't meet the need of what the facility is there, and that's the unique circumstance. The facility there can't meet that need. The property can't do it. Not with, 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 with and again, I, I use the, the word is perfect in there, it's the, um, the unique circumstance of the property. It's a church. That's a unique circumstance. And so consequently, but that's not the property. The feasible alternative, though, I mean, he's trying to deal with the expansion and the need of the so he's saying in regards to feasible alternatives, I think he has an argument there. And he's trying to accommodate, you know, his, his customers and what are the alternates to do this? 
clearly they've gone back and forth and done a lot of stuff. But I don't know what that stuff is. Your floor, I, I give that. I, I yield the floor back to you. And, and I, I, what were the alternatives that were considered? So, so let me speak to one real quick. You spoke to parking and increasing parking on back as if it was flat space parking and a, a low cost alternative. Um, I know that in my coordination with Tom and the importance, and I don't understand all of the stormwater drainage and water capture and all that, but that is important green space back there. And if it's not used as green space, it would become a very significant um, underground drainage system uh, that I think uh, our chairman was alluding to of how expensive that is. So while that's possible um, to pay that back, it's actually a more expensive process than just flat surface paving that I understand. The, so the, just to speak to that quickly, because I think that was kind of, hey, why don't you just throw another, I'd love to throw another 20 parking spots out back, but they're not uh, anywhere near the same uh, financial picture as the parking spots on the side or even the existing expansion that we'll do. It's different. Um, dollars for do dollars for square foot is different. So I just don't want you to think that we could just do it and we're either being lazy or cheap or not. Um, we're, we're evaluating the, the benefits of it. So, and and at this point we won't need those. Um, but the possibility does exist if there's a need there. To the other side of it, yes, yeah, this structure, and it goes back to what I said in my opening comments, that I honestly believe in many ways and very sadly two churches in this community, and I don't know the story with Oak Hill, but I know more of it with Harvest, two churches in this community did not thrive in this place. Two churches in this community did not represent Scarborough well, and I would, in some way, they were unable in a long-term effect to serve the people that were a part of these communities well. Um, I'm sure the individuals, while they were there, were served well, but they were not able to do that in a long-term way. And part of that was the design elements inside. Uh, we are doing everything we can to be specialists and to be technocrats on making sure that our design elements from the width and the depth, because those matter to how communities created and to how people learn. It's why when we go into a movie theater, there aren't 10 rows of movie seats with a 70 foot wide building. They create depth and width because that's how humans engage. And so we're doing everything we can to create a building. And Tom alluded to it that we have brought this in further than would be ideal in this moment. And really, how we fix that is we've created stadium seating. And so uh, we fixed the needed number of seats and the kind of space you need to create. By doing stadium seating, that's allowed us to pull it back a little bit. But there are some changes that will prevent the community from thriving. And, and we can create a building that will not work for people, no matter how good those people are inside. It's a strange fact, but it is a fact. So we are trying to balance those things um, to create, I think as you said on number four, no, re no feasible alternative. The church, a community has to thrive. Um, stagnant is not an option. Stagnant is dying. Stagnant is a pond or a swamp and that will not thrive. And I, I do not want that for our community and I do not want that for your town. So I, we are, in our ways, trying to say what is it um, that will be the best uh, alternative and it is to create a structure that best serves this community. And I mean, I mean this community in every way. I truly hope for that uh, in every way. Uh, I realize those are apartments that surround us, and then you move to, to houses and neighbors right nearby, uh, but I believe that even there, um, there is a benefit uh, to the community that happens. And, and the alternatives to not continuing to grow are where we get into things like relocation. That's why we put numbers of relocation there. No desire to relocate. Love Scarborough, love Gorham Road, and love being your neighbor. But the the alternatives um, are to create space um, for people, and so that's what we've tried to do as best we can, balancing the competing interests of town ordinances and, and construction design along with um, community development. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, I think it might be a good time to start going down through the criteria and, and these discussions can happen with each, each element. If you can form your conclusions, your findings and conclusions for this discussion, because now we're just going to go back through and redo it all over again. Until we put it. Yeah, <laughs> so I think we need, to, we need to start taking up each criteria individually and, and take a vote on that. Sounds good. Everybody ready for that? Okay. 
So the need of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. And Mr. Bolton, step down over to you. Um, I think I commented earlier about how I feel they are in a unique circumstance, and I mean, they only found out last month about the and the DOT incident right away. Um, so I think they do find something that. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's based upon the the fact that they just found out that the MDOT has the uh, uh, the right of way, and uh, and that just changed the property from what they had originally purchased it for and planned for it, and just changed everything. <coughs> Section. It's a TVC section. 
So it doesn't require business. It's it's a mixed use section. Most importantly, but this is zoned R four. That's strictly for that's strictly for that, not necessarily for. Um, they, they didn't want to. No, they didn't want that kind of density that far down. But get a load of this. Remember they said that this jotted out on this piece of property only and then went back in with the, uh, the DOT, which makes that a specific disadvantage to that specific property. But going north or west towards Gorham, they're all... But not at the same depth. No, it goes out. It comes... That piece of property right there, it indents. Is the abutter different? The one going towards Gorm? Yeah. Northwest? As far as the apartment complex next to it? Is that the, I don't, sorry, I'm not sure. If I remember I correctly, from the part, part of the, part of the, the, if I remember, maybe I'm wrong, but part of the comments were that that came down and then it well, jutted It extends there and it continues towards Sawyer Road uh, with that right of way extension. I'm just not. I know it. I know it is contiguous with the next property, the next um, apartment complex. Okay. Going what towards. The one after going that? towards. There's Gore. two apartment complexes. That's the one I'm not certain of. So that that honestly is the one that I'm not certain of. You bet. And so we really do believe that 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 unique circumstance that it is uh, the fact that that line moves on our property line, uh, the fact that when it was constructed, when it was <coughs> built uh, with a phase one, phase two, how to best serve the Scarborough community. Um, that, that property um, should have been able to move in this direction and accomplish this, um, but there's something unique there. And, and when I go towards Green Needle, uh, those houses have the setbacks that you and I are familiar with. Uh, when I go across the street, they have the setbacks that, that are that are as close or closer than the ones that we're requesting. So, and, and I think that goes back to my feeling of this. I would not be here, and I, and I mean this personally. If I thought we were asking for something outside the bounds, if we were trying to get encroach within 10 feet of Route 114... I, I have to be rude. I'm sorry. I think it's really a board thing, so I'm sorry, okay. to, sorry to cut you down on that, but um, unless the board has questions. They're, they're welcome to ask no. your question, but uh, I want to keep it back to the board. Okay, so, so again, I'll, I'll, my, my argument on number one is that that piece, and maybe a couple of others, but that piece loses land as compared to other pieces of property. And as I go west, I come back and where to get an idea where we're I don't think about it. I think, I think both, both the apartment houses were built that way. You look at where they're built, they're built way back I think, in the road. I think you're talking about wetlands, though. No. Uh, uh, who is it that said that they, that judges out? Somebody made a comment. I mean, to, me, to be honest with you, if you were telling me two properties down or three properties down, it comes back, I'm okay with that. You convinced me that it is unique to these few properties. Somebody right mentioned in the presentation. Just out of the side of the neighbors comes back here. Into your argument about properties on the opposite side of the road being closer. And if somebody comes by the goalie, I can't control that. Now I'm judging on someone who wants to build in order to approve this particular application. I, I get it. It's got to. I, I have full respect for that. You do. I do too. <laughs> Mr. Chair, respect for time. Can we go through and see? Yeah. Did, I just want to get that clarification. Uh, you're the person that said that there was a change in that. If I remember correctly, I want to get that. If it's wrong, I want to get that on the record. If it's right, I want to get that on the record. But personally, I think that's an easy answer to that. That answers my question. If it does. Do you want me to show you this or, or just talk about just, it? Just read it in. Yeah. yeah. What? What happens is um, roughly 500 feet, 600 feet before you get to our property coming from Oak Hill, the right of way is wider. It bumps out to back to the original line at that point, comes across that point all the way down to our property, and it bumps back out at our property. So the, the two properties east of us are narrower, are the, the right of way is narrower. And that's going towards Oak, Oak Hill. Hill. Okay. That's correct. And then as you go down beyond it, it juts, it, it looks like it juts back in. Um, Just guess. See, 1,000 feet maybe, down below it, and then back in. I would say that's unique to these properties. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven hundred feet. You I didn't think. give me that. 
Oh, okay, so that's not, that's a, that one. Yeah, why don't we uh, why don't we vote on number one? So, uh, finding facts. Uh, anybody want to put in, put anything in, or else I can. It's up to you. I think we've stated it enough. You okay with what we put in? To me, the ultimate issue is that when it all comes down to it, the, the the fact that unlike not all of the properties have this negative. But it is one of the properties that has that negative of loss, and the other two beside it have that benefit. And so that, to me, is the reason. So, uh, all in, uh, well, do you I have a motion on well, number one? Motion, Mr. Chair. Yes, sure. Quick question. I know we're talking about the properties going towards Oak Hill. Those properties have already been developed with sidewalk. Is that being taken into, an, into account for the setback? Because those already have sidewalk there. I think you're talking about it goes the other way, about a thousand feet down, right? The so currently, problem. there's no sidewalk on our property or either of the properties adjacent to it. All of those will be uh, sidewalks will be added with the with this process since we've already granted that easement, and that will be on both our property and the adjoining. But they're not there currently. And Mr. Chair, can I clarify yes. my statement then? Absolutely. Because of the circumstance of the right of way changing with both going east or south and going west and north of this property. <laughs> I do believe it needs it. Okay. So do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the motion? You're all in favor of the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. That's the end. Thank no. you. No, I no. think there was one. Was there a no? No. Show your, show your hands again. Show your hands again. Unanimous. You, you okay. Uh, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting uh, uh, properties. Bill okay, I'll start down with you. I, I would probably put this back to one property that I see going up right now on the other end of Gorham Road for the brewery that's happening there. You look at the poor people that are next to that building and this looks like it's going to be pretty close to the same size, if not bigger, probably even bigger. You've got houses and you've got people living in apartments on both sides and you've got houses down on the other side. If you look at the big building for the brewery being built right now, it dwarfs over the two houses that are right next to it. I think this is going to have the same similar effect. I'm, I'm not in agreement with this. It does not. It, it has been a reliable change. I think I have a little bit different opinion looking at the other side of that. Um, got apartments next to it, which are pretty big buildings. I think they don't necessarily have to work like a single family home would. Uh, and I believe you heard from both property abutters and they were in support of it. Is that true? Correct. Steve Berg owns the properties on both sides. He's granted us uh, a grading easement on his property to help facilitate full use of it. So, so I think to the owner has been supportive. Thank you. I think to protect his own assets, uh, he would be against this if he felt his property values were going to drop. I'll set the end. Sorry, I'm checking something with the scale real quick. Can you come back? <laughs> I have um, a I don't always one engineer in the group. <laughs> I'm in agreement with this. I mean, it's a church now. It's going to be church later. It's just going to be a little bit bigger church. And you know what? The cars are going to be off the road. So, the big thing to me. I'm in favor of it. I mean, I think this is a nice change. I mean, the impression I'm getting is that the current condition of what you have is not very nice and aesthetically appeasing, and so I think it would be nice for the town and for your members to have this. Um, sorry. Okay, take your time. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm in agreement. I don't think that this will have an undesirable change. Um, I mean, it will be, I mean, it will probably most likely be a, a 25 to 30 foot building going all the way up, but um, based on driving towards the center of town, um, I don't think it will have an undesirable change, especially with, with apartment complexes on each side. That's my thought. And again, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the 
use of fair market value of the abutting property, I, I would argue that it probably will, based on based on the studies that uh, that I've read over and over again from the state, it should have an opposite effect. It should actually uh, entice people to be in that area because that's the whole concept of the the, the money that's being spent with uh, the, the whole. I can't remember the name of the group, but it's all part of CV Cog with it, trying to actually say, bring those communities tighter together. And you do need a core. You need something that is a baseline. So I, I do think it will actually add as opposed to uh, detract. Um, although I won't disagree that will be bigger than, um, uh, I think that the issue, we, the, the brewery is a legitimate point. There is a difference in that brewery area. It's kind of funny. Those houses are opposite from the zone that's in now. That zone got changed, and they built those afterwards for some reason. So it fits more in the zone than the houses do, which is weird. Well, I just can't see a two-hundred and three-foot building fitting there. So it's there, but that's uh, that's my logic behind number two. So do I have a motion on number two? Make a motion to approve. Question number two, as stated. Second. And discussion on the motion. All there. <coughs> Five to one. Um, so no one uses name. The <laughs> real difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. And Mr. Crawford, will start down again with you. I don't have a problem with this one. No, it's not an action that they take, but the DOT's taking that right away. And them, them actually being honest and letting us know about it. Thank you for that. I agree with Mr. Liddell. I agree. Angry? Pretty straightforward, in my opinion. Uh, practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant prior owner, unless you want to blame them for growing the church. I guess you could argue that. <laughs> um, um, do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? That's your name. Thank you. Uh, no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except a variance. And we'll start down with that in this shoot. Well, I think I already commented on this earlier, kind of about you know how I interpret feasible alternatives and what they're kind of dealing with and the expansions that they're trying to do. And I think they've gone back and forth with a lot of different options and kind of come with, up with the best one they can. Um, yeah, I kind of agree. I mean, yeah, they they have other alternatives, but. From a cost point of view, if they've mapped this all out, I'm sure that they know from a cost point of view what's what's uh, uh, attainable and what's not. So uh, I'll agree with them. I would say that um, agree with the place. There's always an alternative, um, no matter what it is. However, I feel that they've explored all the feasible alternatives. Um, from the construction, especially, you know, indicating the cutouts on the drawings, the, the sections that would, they would be missing if they were to shrink the building back behind the right of way, uh, and, and again, also arguing that, you know, the, the, making the point that they would lose function and actual feasibility of doing this entire addition. So, that's it. So, is that? Can I ask a couple additional okay. clarification questions? Yes, feel free. <laughs> Uh, before you had stadium seating, what did the envelope look like in the auditorium area? Well, so it was a larger, it was a larger bump out. Um, it pushed right up, and again, it created um, a space that. So it it was going to be a cheaper space because stadium seating, seating costs more than doing flat seating. Uh, but we needed to pull that back for setbacks. Property line and to create the right width of depth. And is that before you found out about the 100 foot? Yes. And then so you find out, found out about that in an attempt to make it better, you try to pull it back? No, this was our limit before that. We can't, okay. that's, that's what we're saying. We can't pull it back any further than this. Okay. And the architect considered widths and it didn't work for them? Do you yes. know that? Correct. And I even have that email from him. And actually, just one thing to the, the option. I, I we had tried to just do uh, an expansion space like this up front yeah. that wouldn't even impinge on this, 
and we could not make the physical space for both people and events to work. Would you be kind enough to forward that letter so that we can put that on record? Where the architect says the architect this width changes the angles? No. Yes. We wouldn't do that. Then. We wouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Buses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> A train left the station already. But now I'm coming in late. And you're, you're, but you're taking the vote tonight, <laughs> so no more evidence is going to be submitted. But you can use that. Unless you want to take it. Can this be considered? You can, yeah, you can, you can take his testimony. It doesn't look like a liar. So you can. Uh, <laughs> can this be considered finding the fact? <laughs> yes, it can. Thank you. Uh -huh. so, that yeah. answers my question. <laughs> Mr. Crockett. Um, when <coughs> we first started talking about this, there was mention that there wasn't another alternative. And I've heard numerous times, monetary-wise, it was the reasoning why you didn't want to do it. That's not our job, right. to look at it monetary-wise. Our job is to look at, if you have another feasible alternative, you do have other feasible alternatives. Mr. Loisel actually looked at a feasible alternative, and kind of the comments that he got on it was it was going to cost too much money to do that. So money is obviously a factor in any construction project. We're going to spend, we intend to spend $3.2 million, so there's a financing aspect of it. But I think what I tried to say clear to Ms. Loisel was that the changing shape does change the functionability of it. That we very intentionally... Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking a question. I'm just stating okay. my point. So I thought you were. No. Okay. Uh, any other comments on that? Mine is, um, it, it kind of goes back to B uh, with practical difficulty and also the word feasible. Uh, feasible is reasonable, not... Uh, and then the other than that, I think that's a good definition. Is there's always a way to you, know, you can you can do a lot of things, but feasible means practical and reasonable while still meeting the needs of the organization, be it the church or being at Walmart. Uh, and I would argue that that does meet that standard. Uh, so the uh, the item is. The, uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Uh, do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Yeah. All in favor? That is five to one. Mr. And the uh, grant of variance will be result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. And if you want to jump at that, Mr. I don't see that. I know. I respectfully disagree with the chair. It's fine to disagree with me. Unless you remind me. Notion of what classifies Oak Hill. Oak Hill. <laughs> I would classify the beginning of Oak Hill as basically the school's on up. I mean, it's residential path that you have a whole street. Let's make that argument after the meeting. <laughs> I think we beat, one, beat that one to death. I'm going to paint it on the road. <laughs> you're asking for my finding a fact. No, good. You're doing good. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, you're doing fine. I mean, that, that's my own they should they don't just have it on you. Too bad. Well, that's my determination of finding the fact. Okay. I don't agree. There is a street that has four residential houses all along it and there's two complexes and there's residences right across. Mr. Lizon? I think again, you can argue it both ways, but in this case I believe that uh, looking at the current requirements under the construction uh, for this type of a building, it, it meets it. I would agree. I'll agree with this. I agree with, uh, with them. I mean, I, I think you pointed out before that actually the surrounding properties are, if not the same, or some of them are closer to the, to the road than what they're proposing right now. And uh, the question was the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. I do believe you have to look at the backyard, which is a school. Um, so it does affect, that is part of that neighborhood. And so it is more conforming. That's me personal. Uh, do I have a motion on that item? So moved. Second. Any discussion on the motion? And then all there. Five, one. And the next one is, uh, the uh, granting of the variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Ms. Shoup, can we start down there? No, I mean, I think we discussed this, and you, you know, you talk about how you're going to be responsible for the water and all those things. And really, the expansion, my understanding is there's really not much that's going to be changing on the front there. So 
Yeah, I think the planning board is going to hold them in tow on this one. Um, and I think they know pretty much what they have to do as far as the runoff from the parking lots, so on and so forth. So I think they've got a good handle on this. I agree. I'll just reiterate my final fact earlier. Uh, Mr. Greer indicated the upgrading the water stormwater management standards in the area. <coughs> I think I agree. I, I'm hoping the planning board will address it because, as you mentioned, the street above, and I don't know if it's still an old folk retirement community it used to be when it was originally built for Village Oak Hill. And this heavy rain, this water is just flowing from the property, your property, mm -hmm. over to theirs. And I mean, the whole road is washed out for all those residences. Right. So I'm hoping the planning board will address that. I agree with you. I think that the best thing could happen for the neighborhood is this because I do believe that they, if they're, they will address that. Uh, and, and you know, a good example of that is when they put the nursing facility up on Route 1, and we were very concerned about that, and the condos were very concerned about that, and I've heard no complaints about the water issues at all from that. Maybe there are, but I don't know about them, and we were the ones that approved it. So to me, it meets that need. So again, the granting of very unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Do so I have a motion? Motion. Second. Discussion on the motion? No? All in favor? That's unanimous. And then it's not in the flood zone, so we don't have to worry about that. And the last two dimensional standards, those provisions of uh, this ordinance, which relate to the lot area, lot coverage, frontage, and setback, including the buffer, hey, we use the buffer, uh, requirements. Practical difficulty of case where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both preclude the use of property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result and significant economic injury to the applicant. When we step down with this traffic. Um, I agree. I agree. Uh, the case where the strict application and dimensional standards of the audience to the property for which this variance is sought would both preclude a use and the property uh, of the property which is permitted in the zone and which is located also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. I think um, uh, the fact that there have been churches that have not been able to make it uh, says that. And uh, I do think you know, that the, that's the highest and best use for the facility, or the only use of the facility. And obviously, that highest and best use hasn't worked. So, uh, for whatever reason. So, I'm going to it. Do you have a motion on that? Second. Discussion? Seeing none out there. That's unanimous. Okay. And so then the final, uh, do I have a motion on the final? Uh, motion to appeal 2603 as presented. Second. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor? And opposed? And it's one opposed. It carries. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One last thing I've got to read before we close out, guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll do it before there's any board comments. We'll, we'll slip this in. I'm going to slip in. Guys, I need to slip one more thing in. I'm sorry, I should have said it earlier. There's one more item that was slipped into the agenda. It's a six month extension request for nine shipwreck. Uh, thank you for meeting us last, last week as we continue the process and renovate our cottage at nine shipwreck road, Higgins Beach. As you know, the property is family and cottage. Uh, jointly owned by David Askell and Mr. Do Sarah Douglas. Sadly, Sarah's uh, husband, uh, Gregory, was diagnosed with advanced pancreatic ca cancer this past October, and he has been undergoing treatment in Florida since then. Uh, obviously, this is a sad reality has taken center stage in Sarah and Gregory's life, and we cannot expect them to be available in the coming weeks to focus on our project. Based on this, uh, we are requesting that the town grant us a six-month extension on the variance that was approved in December, allowing us to delay the start of the construction on the project to late fall of this year. In the meantime, we are proceeding with our building and floor plans 
We'll be ready to submit those and see you later in the summer in order to gain our building permit. It won't go to us, it'll go to the um, uh, plant farm. Uh, uh, thank you for your understanding and cooperation with the response to your request. This is Karen David Haskell. Uh, so I have a motion to accept the extension on this property, which is a standard procedure now that uh, has been put in place for us. I move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none out there. That's unanimous. I'm sorry to hear that uh, for the family. I uh, glad we're able to help them at least a little bit. Right. Ms. Blomstaff, any other comments for tonight? Uh, no, other than to um, uh, welcome Mr. Loisel, and we do thank Jim Stark for his service. At some point, we will have a partake parade or something <laughs> in his honor um, he whenever he's back in country. <laughs> <laughs> But welcome, welcome back, um, and and I just would like to reiterate that, um, yeah, I'm hard on you guys all the time, uh, but you, you do a good job and you do a great service for the community and I appreciate every one of you that dedicates your time to this board. It, it can't go uh, without being said enough that um, that's a, uh, you're shouldering a big responsibility. In my mind, it's a very significant one and I appreciate everybody that does this. Well, your, your advice has been valuable to us, I know that. I don't think any one of us would, would uh, question. You bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, experience to the table that we don't have. Would you so mind putting you. that in writing for my wife? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not part of the record. <laughs> <laughs> that train's gone. <laughs> According to her, I have no knowledge at all. <laughs> Anybody else wish to have any comments for tonight? Seeing none. Do you have a motion? Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Do you have Captain in there? Because Captain's table. You guys have to remember that.